Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 26. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Barons, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden. From the origins of the dog girl, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Behrens' Lizzie Borden Girl Detective mystery series. In this episode, we are delighted to have Peggy Ray Johnson, award-winning director and actor, and member of the Voice and Speech Trainers Association. She has multiple voiceovers to her credit, including recordings for Simon & Schuster Publishers. She will perform a dramatic reading of The Melancholy Scion. This story was first published in The Hatchet, a journal of Lizzie Borden and Victorian Studies in 2007 and is now a part of the Audible Amnesiac and other Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mysteries by Richard Behrens, published in 2018. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents The Melancholy Scion by Richard Behrens. May 1927, French Street, The Hill, Fall River, Massachusetts. One, pressed in lavender. For Lizzie Borden, Andre de Camp will always be the poet. In all her 66 years on earth, she had never been known to pay such reverence, silent or otherwise, to any member of the male sex, whether to applaud virtue or to praise physical elegance. But Andre de Camp, scion of a wealthy French family that had relocated to Fall River in the summer of 1877, a tall, brooding, and decidedly handsome bachelor of 19 years, the product of private advanced education, brilliant, fastidious in his manly dress, and precise in his manners and ethics, held a special place in Lizzie's estimation of the masculine half of humanity. She first glimpsed him at a midsummer charity event in the church hall of the First Congregational. Standing with his illustrious family, the father wearing proudly a decorated uniform, the mother and sister standing upright with pious concentration, and Andre bowed his head toward Lizzie just once, as if in humble supplication before a higher power. The gesture sent a chill through Lizzie's being. She quickly became impressed with how the decamp men were so very different from the money-driven barons who banked her city, the uncultured factors and industrialists who would never design a cathedral or build an opera hall lest they consider it a foolish dollar spent. Andre de Camp may have been spawned from that same class, yet he brought with him all the cultured elegance of Paris and the dark mysteries of the southern Languedoc locales that Lizzie had admired from afar through sepia photographs of the mountainous region with its lush outcroppings and deep vein soil, a land she thought only existed in her dreams. Andre was a graceful, aristocratic youth who, like herself, was more comfortable with the personal passions and the aesthetics of everyday life than with the complexities of commerce. She saw in him not the proud marshals and presidents of France's dusty past, nor the great sun king in his splendid palace, but the simple shepherds from the paintings of Poussin, the noble musketeers of Dumas, and the provincial people of the tales of Flaubert. He embodied in his presence all the excitement, adventure, and beauty 
that she had admired in the great French paintings and novels that made their way to various Fall River parlors. In her opinion, he far outpaced in every manner the grown men of his generation. But for the rest of her days, she would never speak his name aloud. Even as an aging woman of the hill, secluded in her summer bedroom in the rambling Maplecroft, her manse and hermitage, alone as she looked back upon a dark and hidden life, she would only speak of Andre as the poet, and then briefly, and then only to a chauffeur or a domestic who was not of her generation, who would never have heard of the DeCamp family, or would never repeat her words to anyone in town who may have known them. And then, only when she was caught off guard with some seizure of nostalgia for a fall river that had once been and now was no more. But when the glimmer came to her aging eyes, she spoke of the poet. When she made oblique references to faces and places now lost to time and memory, when she hinted that once she had loved, and felt within her breast a singular passion the likes of which had never been repeated. It was the summer of 1877, and the case of the melancholy scion to which her thoughts took her. Back to a time before she was the secluded spinster on the hill, before she sat alone in church because no fellow citizens would occupy the pews adjoining hers, before she was accused of that terrible crime whose shadow she would never escape, back when she was young and fresh and alive to the time when she walked the streets of Fall River with André de Camp, who also was young and fresh and alive, and who, despite her unwillingness to let her heart be so directly touched, had truly loved her. Back when she was Lizzie Borden, Girl Detective. Two, Unsettling Revelations. 1877, South Main Street, Fall River. Andrew Jackson Borden took his pre-dinner constitutional from the front of his quaint little Greek revival house on 2nd Street towards the tonsorial parlor, the post office, and the pharmacy to, respectively, get a shave, check for his mail, and to inquire about the gastroesophageal disruption pills his wife Abby needed for her burning chest pain. Threading his way through the narrow streets, surrounded by the bustle of pedestrian traffic, the whinnying of nags, the clattering of buggies, and the hawking of the fishmongers, Borden turned to survey the town that had given him birth and had nurtured him through his rise to prosperity. So many estate properties, he thought to himself, so many empty lots. If only I could possess them all, to have that locus of power over the domestic and commercial fare of every individual in Fall River. He allowed himself this one pure moment of magnitude, imagining an inflated likeness of himself that lay unrealized by his business colleagues. And then, with a wistful grin that barely moved the edge of his mouth, pushed on towards the barber for his weekly trimming. At that very moment, a short squat man with a bulbous nose and bristling mustache stopped in front of Andrew, ungraciously blocking his path. Are you A.J. Borden, I believe? Andrew lifted his chin proudly. I do have that honor. The man's mouth made a strange, mumbling motion, and then, before Andrew could take refuge in flight, the man bellowed an almost incomprehensible Fleah! and a large wad of saliva came flying across the distance between them, landing with a sickening thwack on Andrew's cheek. Here's for your thievery and your damned Allsworth, the attacker shouted. Take a rest in one of your own flimsy coffins, why don't you? Hang ye be to Arkady. And then the man was gone, leaving Andrew to wipe away his indignity with a hastily drawn handkerchief. 
All's worth? Andrew pondered as a few passers-by giggled and pointed. Could that be the family he had driven from the Anawan Street property? Better for them. They couldn't afford the rent. Not on the cloth-doffing salary that Tobias Allsworth had settled for after the end of his whaling career. The wife and seven children were much better off as wards of the city, where at least they could be assured that they would be fed every day. But who had been his attacker? And what connection could he have had with this Allsworth? Surely he took a dedicated passion to accost and insult a prominent citizen in broad daylight before gawking pedestrians. Andrew turned to head home, but was surprised to see his young daughter Lizzie standing on the street corner in a pretty pink and white striped fantail skirt and a polonaise fresh from La Mode Illustre, topped off with a cunning chip hat laden with silk pansies perched high aloft her curly hair. She was positioned by a lamp post with a far twinkle in her wide blue-gray eyes. Daughter, Andrew said, pointing in the direction of the fleeting assailant, I am afraid you had to witness an unexplained ignominy. Father, Lizzie said, her voice thinner than usual, I did not see anything. For I'm adrift in a waking reverie. You are indeed adrift. I don't think that I have ever seen you in such ponderous daydreaming. What distracts you from your daily duties? I have been to the charity event this very hour on Saturday past. Yes, indeed. You, ac you accompanied myself and Mrs. Borden. Emma, I believe, was home with a complaint. And at the church, I had occasion to see the party of Frenchmen who have recently joined our community from abroad. Borden nodded, his mouth a-clenched. Rubbing his unshaven cheek, he explained, The de Camp clan, mighty proud people, they bought the Durfee estate and are in the process of establishing an import-export concern. The Comte de Rien, the father, is an enterprising gentleman, albeit a bit taken with lofty matters, such as art and music, subjects not quite befitting a man of his industrious character. They are highly cultured then, Lizzie said, her eyes widening. Oh, father, do tell me that they are versed in all matters of aesthetics, poetries, Rome's a clef, sonnets and concertos, painting and architecture. Tell me that young Andre can dance to a rondo as easily as he can recite Shakespearean soliloquies, that as a family they have that spark of creativity within which transcends the ordinary particulars of our daily labors and occupations. Andrew heaved an unpleasant grunt. If you mean do they listen to operatic claptrap or read the ramblings of word mongers, then, yes, daughter, they are aesthetes. Lizzie smiled, her face reddening in the afternoon sunlight. I am glad of it. Young Andre has caught my fancy, but I think you must not tell a soul about my feelings. Andrew struggled to process this evidence of his daughter's awakening womanhood. He knew in the past that she had been distracted by boys, but she always maintained a short temper and a feigned indifference, perhaps to avoid complications. And she had socialized with strange, undeveloped male specimens like Homer Thessinger, the boy inventor, who presented himself more as a child, despite his recent attainment of standing six feet tall. But Andre, the handsome youth, who had been introduced as Jacques de Camp's scion, he was altogether different. He was stern and determined, calm and centered. He was also several years Lizzie's elder and seemed strong enough to conquer her coquettish behavior, if such was his will. No, this would not do. The de Camp boy must be denied access to Lizzie by any means necessary. 
daughter, Andrew said, his mouth tightening against the emerging words. Need I remind you that the Count is a Roman Catholic? They attend mass at St. Anne's, don't you know? Father, Lizzie smirked, by now you should know that when it comes to spiritual matters, I ascribe the choice of worship to be up to each and every man's conscience. Besides, I am told that the Count has a Protestant mother. Yes, he grumbled. Well, what then would you say if I told you that there is much scandal surrounding young Andre? Scandal? Her eyes peered purposefully, trying to discern his meaning. Whatever could you mean? Much has been discovered about the family since their appearance in town. I have already heard word from my fellow stockholders at the mill who make it their business to investigate the background of newly arrived immigrants that Jacques de Camp, the father of your beloved boy, has clearly sailed through their careful scrutiny. But I fear to say that young Andre has not fared as well. The boy is known, Andrew paused for dramatic effect, he is known to frequent houses of assignation. He is a sporting boy. Lizzie felt the fluttering in her head long before she could digest her father's statements. Assig, she muttered, sporting. Then she lifted a hand to her forehead and began her downward spiral toward the sidewalk. Andrew leaped forward and caught her in his arms, her eyes were shifting violently back and forth under her lids. A man in a bowler hat with trim mutton chops emerged from the moving traffic of pedestrians and offered his services. Is the young lady all right? he asked. I am a doctor. Ah, Borden, I see Lizzie has taken ill. Andrew recognized his second street neighbor, Dr. Seabury Bowen, and watched breathlessly while a doctor brought a cracked tablet to her nostrils. She groaned, showing signs of life. Will she live? asked Andrew grimly. Examine her parlor, said the doctor, pointing. She has merely fainted, nothing more. Andrew scratched at his beard. I suppose you want some brass for your services, Seabury. I am at your service, the doctor said, trying to haul Lizzie to her feet and tip his bowler simultaneously. No coin required. Let us just get the poor girl home. Andrew hesitated, assessing Dr. Bowen carefully. You do not mean to clap me with a summation upon arrival? I will not honor it. Dr. Bowen took a patient breath. I have heard of you, Mr. Borden. You need not fear any trickery from me. I am concerned only for the girl's health. Your daughter, I presume? Yes, it is Lizzie, Andrew huffed. Be about your business, man. It is a harsh day when I confront an honest doctor. But I will tolerate your aid for my Lizzie's sake. Spring to it, man. As he helped Dr. Bowen carry Lizzie the two short streets to their home on 2nd Street, Andrew pondered Lizzie's reaction to the revelations about the DeCamp boy. He felt a brief pang of guilt over distressing his daughter to the point of fainting. But my actions were all correct, he rationalized. No good could come out of Andre DeCamp. Not for my daughter. Three, a desperate visitor. Lizzie awoke in her cramped bedroom on the upper floor of the Borden's modest Second Street house. Fully clothed and reclined on her bed, her forehead beaded with sweat, she struggled to make sense of the tolling of the church bell. The small walls and their flowered paper caved in on her as she fought for her breath. Lizzie Andrew, came a sharp cry. Springing to her feet, she felt a disoriented rush of blood to her head as she nearly fell back onto the mattress. Her shoulders were caught fast by two hands that emerged from below a thin and chinless face that was now coming into focus. Lizzie's elder sibling, 
Emma was standing before her, a frown upon her brow. My sister, Emma sighed. Sometimes I fear that you have the falling sickness. No, sister, Lizzie said, bringing the back of her hand to her forehead. It is Fall River that has the falling sickness. Emma waggled her head as if trying to dislodge a disturbed thought. I have ceased to attempt understanding your inane ramblings. One would think that you had been secretly dropped on your head when you were a child. Would that the act was repeated to clear my mind of these worries. A flash of recognition came across Emma's face. You are pursuing your consulting services again. I swear by all the heavens, Lizzie, that is all nonsense. Pay more attention to your proper duties. Emma, Lizzie said earnestly, I have heard this day that our town is host to sporting boys, and where there are sporting boys, her eyes took a quick dart about the room, there are fancy girls. Her sister flinched with great discomfort at the phrases that she was hearing. If such matters go on in this town, Emma said with a shrug, it is the province of the law to sort it out, and the mandate of the Almighty above to judge their sins. For now, all we can do is suffer our mundane tasks upon the earth. Mundane tasks? Lizzie suppressed a spontaneous chuckle. Yes, mundane. Mrs. Borden has some paper wrappers for us to address. And I believe there is a buggy to bring to Swansea Farm. Do you not remember that today is Wednesday? Now, be downstairs in a few moments, composed and alert and she darted from the room, more frustrated than concerned. Lizzie stood alone, staring into space, thinking. After changing her downstreet ensemble for a cotton calico and stout tie Oxford, clothing more suitable for scrambling after eggs in a chicken coop, Lizzie came down the front stairs of the house to find her stepmother, Abby Borden, by the front door. Abby was a plump woman of fifty-two, with a dour and haggard face, as if she had spent the better part of a lifetime trying to feign cheerfulness with little reward. "'I'm glad to see you well,' Abby said cursorially, handing her a stack of paper wrappers. "'Mr. Borden is hiding in his rooms, fearing Dr. Bowen's summation. One day that man shall be the death of us. From the sitting room door emerged a smart and handsome man, his warm eyes twinkling above his mutton-chopped mustache. Miss Lizzie, he said, nodding his chin respectfully. Dr. Seabury Bowen, I trust you are feeling much better? Very fine, doctor. I've never felt better. Are you the man who aided me in my time of distress? I have that honor. Even I, a poor medical man attempting to establish himself with such modest resources, has heard of the great Lizzie Borden, the girl detective of Fall River. Abby groaned, her hands fleeing to her apron. What nonsense! Girl detective, indeed! <laughs> Your daughter is quite an accomplished woman, Mrs. Borden. I am pleased to see her fine and healthy. Now it is for her father, I fear. He seems to be in a state of apoplexy, as if something is weighing upon his mind. He muttered about a man who accosted him in the street. I believe father said something about it, Lizzie said, but I do not think that I remember. Abby sighed. Your father does indeed have many enemies, since he has elevated his station in life. No doubt many of them wish him harm. I believe it was an English bard, Dr. Bowen added, who described the king that must wear the crown as having an uneasy head. Sleep comes dear to such a man. Amen, Abby concluded. Now, Lizzie, you have chores to run. 
Emma's in the barn, harnessing the rig. I suspect she'll call for you shortly. Dr. Bowen removed his bowler from the standing rack, bid the ladies good afternoon, and took his leave. Abby bolted the door after him. There are some doctors in this town who are decent at heart, Mrs. Borden, Lizzie said smugly. Don't let father begrudge such a man. To your chores, Abby quipped. Don't dally. There is much to be done. It is Wednesday, you know. Lizzie took the wrappers and entered the kitchen where the stove was ablaze and some papers were already burning. Staring into the grate, Lizzie could see that they were legal documents touching upon property estates. For a brief moment, Lizzie thought she could discern the name Allsworth on one of the papers. Something flickered in the back of her memory, something she had heard while drinking her heir's sarsaparilla at the pharmacy with her friends, something about a whaling man who had vanished and his indigent wife and children. She was about to reach in and try to salvage the paper when she sensed a fluttering in the air behind her. Spinning around, Lizzie was facing her stepmother, who stood with her hands thrust into her apron, a look of astonishment on her face. Lizzie Andrews, Abby said, her voice humbled. There is a gentleman to see you. I do believe he is a gentleman, despite his garish appearance. Although I doubt your father would ever allow such a person into his home. Garish? Is he fancied up like a saloon performer? No, he is. Well, perhaps you'd best see for yourself. Lizzie came back to the parlor to find a very tall man standing by the piano. He was jowly and broad, covered in a red brocade of fine military threads, his feet planted firmly on the carpet, his strong arms bent behind his back. A domino mask obscured his eyes and nose, and a broad cape flowed like a theatrical curtain behind him. His mustaches extended below the mask and stood firm and proud like they were testifying a profound yes to the vagaries of life. And while his mustaches were displaying defiance against darkness, his jutting chin was mastering the art of adjuration, a proud opulence that spoke of an abandoned country and a melancholy exile. Here was a man that radiated energy, masculine and forceful. Lizzie felt self-secure enough to stand firm before him and to extend her hand without diverting her eyes from his piercing gaze. He gave a brief smile. Miss Lizzie Borden, the girl detective. Lizzie held out her hand and he gently pressed his lips to it. Forgive my forgery of identity, he continued, for I have a high position in this town's industry, and I must keep it secret, even from you, my potential consultant. I am intrigued, Lizzie waved towards the pillowed sofa. Please have a seat and explain to me how I can be of service. I prefer to stand, the strange visitor exclaimed. It provides extra labor for the legs, but my circumstance is such that at a moment's notice, I must spring like a lion for shelter. I cannot be too safe. I see, said Lizzie, occupying the sofa with a coquettish descent. Please explain to me how I can be of service to you. He executed a hasty cough, his mustaches quivering, and then he began. I represent a rather large number of Fall River businessmen, many of whom are aware of my identity, but none of whom know that I am consulting with you. Besides yourself, your most polite mother and the coachman who is in my private employ, no one knows of my visit here today. That is Mrs. Borden, Lizzie corrected nodding toward the door that Abby was no doubt pressing her ear against. She is not my mother, Lizzie raised her voice to proclaim. My mother is dead. Ah, I see. You must forgive my faux pas. 
No offense taken, Mr. Uh, you may call me Chase. Yes, that name would be suitable. But I may resume with the narrative of my situation. I am in communication with a large number of European concerns that are investigating the Fall River market, primarily interested in buying up stock in industry here. Some of those concerns have ties with the royal families of Eastern Europe. As you may know, there is quite a fuss going on abroad due to the conflicts uh, with the Ottomans and the Slavic lands. England and France are quite busy with their espionage and intrigue, both of them taking sides one way or the other with the Russians over this terrible conflagration in Bulgaria. The Russian army has crossed the Danube and is laying siege as we speak to the city of Plevna. The death toll is mounting and there are those who wish to see a hasty end to this campaign. Lizzie nodded. I read the Fall River Herald on a daily basis, Mr. Chase, while I heat my irons. I have perused some editorials about the affair with the Turks. Then you are aware that Europe is now a powder keg waiting for a match to fall upon it. And when that happens, there will be a conflict such as the world has never before seen. Lizzie sighed, meditating upon the foolish games of powerful men and all their silly armies and conflicts. There does seem to be quite a large amount of consternation. I can imagine the outcome of such an imbroglio, but what has this to do with anything concerning which I can help you with? Chase rocked on his heels. A Russian noble of some reputation has bought up large amounts of textile stock in order to raise funds for a private army to fight the Turks. I was to be the liaison between the Russian and a certain European government. He has sent an agent, an inventor, to speak on behalf of Russian industry. What could this Russian possibly have to offer the foreign government that could be so valuable, asked Lizzie, and why Fall River? The eyes under the domino mask darted from side to side as if scanning the room for spies. The Russian inventor had laid out the plans for a new self-acting mule, which, when it was combined with the new haze and trumpet throstle spinner, and put into production at his test plant in Moscow, quadrupled his yarn output and tripled his pick per yard. We intend to sell this patent for the self-acting mule to the highest bidder in Fall River while retaining a commission on each yard spun using the technology. This particular mule technology will revolutionize the entire industry. The first manufacturer who adopts it will become wealthy beyond his imagination and the Russian shall have his privately funded army to fight the Turks and raise the siege of Plevna. Lizzie shrugged. Personally, I prefer the pleasure of a summer's afternoon eating pears in the yard, but I can see that when money and power are involved, men will do anything to exploit the common mill worker. Yes, it is very true, but Air Marx should have his way. Well, Mr. Chase raised a handkerchief to his sweating brow. That is a story for another time. He stared in reverie at the far wall, his mind lost in some anguished internal debate. So you tell me that this Russian inventor is in Fall River with the plans for his invention, Lizzie said, picking up the thread of conversation. Yes but there is one particular that he did not count on. His plans have been stolen. Lizzie raised her hand to her mouth. My Lord. Yes, 
there has been perfidy of the most sinister kind. This Monday last at 10 in the evening, while the Russian inventor was asleep in his hotel, a scoundrel entered the premises and stole the plans. Did he not have them locked up somewhere for safekeeping? Ah, that is the embarrassing part. He had ingeniously stowed the plans inside a medical, uh, how do you Americans say it, a pessary, which he inserted into a chamber of his own anatomy. Modesty forbid me to locate the particular chamber in which the pessary was stowed. I see, said Lizzie, blushing slightly. I believe it is a suppository you are referring to. May we? Yes, indeed, a pessary. The fiend put him to sleep with liquid ether, administered with a cloth over his nose, and then went to work extracting the container. Such a hiding place would not easily be accessed, Lizzie sighed. But when a man is unconscious, all sorts of violations are possible. Yes, that is exactly what I said to the foreign government. But they did not find such comments amusing. They told me I had 24 hours to find the plans, with or without the pessary, and that if I did not produce them before the arranged time for the meeting with the mill owners on Friday afternoon, I shall be removed immediately from my position as liaison. In such a case, I shall return home a ruined man, all my investments canceled and my prospects in America reduced to nothing. Hence, the desperation with which I approach you. Time must be of the essence, Lizzie suggested. More than you can imagine, Miss Borden. Even more at stake than my own reputation is the fate of Europe. If the patent negotiations break down with the Russians, the balance of power will shift to those nations backing the Ottomans. All the stresses and tensions that are holding Europe in check will unravel and there will be a violent and bloody war amongst the nations. Shall I say a world war? to coin a phrase. The tall, mysterious man paused for dramatic effect. Out in the street, a nearby church was tolling the hour. The clopping of horse hooves and the crying of the fishmongers lingered in the room. A darkness came over Mr. Chase's masked face as he waited for her response. Lizzie took a deep breath. But why come to me, she asked. I am merely the youngest daughter of a furniture salesman. I have no particular aptitude with which to deal with industrial politics, far less military wars abroad. But you are Lizzie Borden, the girl detective. Among the board members of the leading mills, you are notorious for bringing down Livermore, the mill owner who killed his own plant manager. You have shown fortitude, intellect, and powers of detection that some consider uncanny. I come to you as my last hope to save not only my paltry self, but to help maintain the balance of power in Europe. Yes, Lizzie shrugged. I did perform quite well during the case of the purloined curio, and I was commended by no less than the mayor himself for the adventure of the antiquated blunderbuss. But I still don't agree that you have to hide from me, Monsieur Jacques de Camp, Comte de Rienne. Zut lols, came the bellowing reply from the sturdy giant. His cheeks went slack, and his hands fell to his sides. I am undone. How did you know? It is simplicity itself, Lizzie proclaimed. You are doing an appreciable imitation of an American accent, but there are certain nuances in your nasality that bespeak a French origin. 
Further, your mustache is of a particular cut that I have seen only in daguerreotypes of gentlemen from the hills around Carcassonne in the Languedoc. And I do believe I see embossed on your forefinger's ring the characteristic coat of arms for the Merovingian lineage, long since banished from the Franco-monarchial scene, but forever bound with honor and respect within the decamp line, which I have studied at my local lending library, exhausting its modest resources on the topic. As for your tales of Russian and Turkish conflicts, one need not go further than the few scraps of articles that can be read while heating flats for the grand session of handkerchief ironing to know that England is attempting to stop the Russians from going to war with the Ottomans, while France is wholeheartedly backing the Russians' campaign. Further, the French government has recently investigated land grants in the Taunton River area for possible developments of mills that would run by France's own interests. One cannot put all these facts together without deducing that you are indeed a French investor recently imported into Fall River, and the only French investor I know of who fits that description is Jacques de Camp whom I have scrutinized at a charity event this Saturday past, and who has the same hairstyling as you, not to mention the same mustache, jowls, and green-gray eyes. The domino mask and the perfected American accent did not fool me one jot, for I am a girl detective. De Camp was thunderstruck. His mustache puffed with his cheeks. How oh, extraordinary, he roared his French accent becoming more apparent, and in one so young. How can you doubt your abilities after such a display? The Russians are almost assured that their precious self-acting mule plans will be retrieved. My commendations. He bowed low, almost to the ground. Upon his upsweep, Lizzie said with a wry smile, how delightful that a cultivated man of such stature should bow to me, a poor little girl in such a modest little house. She laughed and raised her hands to her mouth. Oh, dear, that is precious. Well, Monsieur Le Comte, you may relax and remove your disguise. How may I be of assistance to you in this very strange affair? With all pretense tossed to the wings, the French aristocrat, with a sweeping gesture, removed the mask to reveal a handsome, if not rugged, face and deeply intelligent eyes. I want you to find the mule plans, he announced. But where do I begin? The thief must be miles from Fall River by now. No, I believe him still to be in this city. Presumably by accident. De Camp lifted up a ring that glimmered in the sunlight shafting through the parlor window. Lizzie took it for inspection and saw a crimson letter A centered on the ring's faceplate. I have not seen this before, Lizzie said, a shudder coming over her. I have. It is the sign of a secret society that operates right here in town. The Arcady Society. I am not quite sure what their objectives are, but it seems likely that they are nihilists whose only goal is to topple the Tsar from power and bring about a worker state in Russia. They have a vested interest in preventing the Russian expansion into the Crimea, and God alone knows what their plans are for Fall River. And this ring is a symbol of their brotherhood? Yes, the letter A is a symbol of the sudden violence that will erupt when the common man is ready to rise above his masters. They are no doubt influenced by Bakunin and his lot. I do believe elements of their society, inspired by the successful assassination of your President Lincoln in 1865, are planning the same fate for the Tsar. They are aware that my mission in Fall River is an obscure but crucial step in the Tsar's plan to reinforce his military victories. 
Lizzie curled her fingers around the ring and sighed. I find this all most fascinating, she said. I would most heartily love to work on the case. I can reward you handsomely. Money is not an object. My purse is open for your use. No need. My consulting services are done purely for the good of all people everywhere. I have no material needs to compensate. I do, however, have a few questions regarding the robbery. How big is this container? About the size of a peach pit. The plans, which have been printed on delicate tissue paper, are folded very tightly. But recall, Miss Borden, that plans may no longer be in the pessary. I am aware of that. Of what material is it made? Solid iron, embossed with the Romanov coat of arms and with a hinge that opens into its cavity. This Russian inventor, where does he hail? St. Petersburg. He has been sent straight by the Tsar himself to secure the contracts with the Fall River businessmen. Where did the theft take place? At the Hotel Wilbur, not more than ten minutes' walk from this very house. Do the textile men know of the unfortunate robbery? Mon Dieu! That would mean disaster. They are currently under the impression that we will be presenting the plans for the self-acting mule by this time Friday morning. That is most unfortunate. That ring that you found in the hotel room of the Russian, was it simply lying on the floor? I find it unusual that a ring can so conveniently slip off an intruder's finger. Ah, de Camp said screwing up his eyes, as if to try to find the exact words. The ring was not exactly lying on the floor. It had fallen off inside the Russian during the process of extracting the pessary. Oh, Lizzie said with a shudder. Yes, Decamp sighed. Please do not ask for details on how we discovered it. I am not used to discussing such matters with a young lady. Needless to say, the Russian is mortified beyond words, and for security purposes has been sequestered in a safe place far from this town. We shall save the details for another day, Lizzie agreed. I would like to see the hotel room where the Russian was assailed. By all means. Be at the Hotel Wilbur this very afternoon. I must exercise discretion and disappear from the scene. So you shall rendezvous with my son, André, who will represent me in this matter. Report to the lobby of the Wilbur at three of the clock. Lizzie's chest tightened. I don't believe I have had the honor to meet your son before. Andre is a fine garçon, just turned nineteen. He has a bit of a fiery disposition, and he is very strong in his opinion about foreign affairs. We often clash over such matters, but he is loyal to our famille languedocienne. The bloodlines run very deep, and he is a proud scion. Lizzie rose to her feet. I shall meet your son then at three at the Wilbur Hotel. Three o'clock, the Comte de Rien bowed once more, tucked on his domino mask, and ushered himself towards the front hallway. A bientôt, he said wistfully. From up the hallway came Emma's thin voice. Lizzie, I have rigged the buggy with no help from you, thank you. Then she appeared in the parlor, dressed in a flowery hat, just as the Comte spun on his axis. Emma had barely caught a darting glimpse of the man in the cape and the mask when she let out with a bellowing shriek. All the color drained from her face, and her hands raced toward her face. Emma, Lizzie said, just as startled. But it was too late. 
Lizzie's older sister had bolted from the front stairs and was stomping upwards toward the safety of her bedroom, making strange, whimpering noises. I am profoundly apologetic, Decomp said with a nod toward Lizzie. If I had known... It is all correct, Monsieur le Comte, Lizzie said. Emma is used to far worse. Lizzie stared at him through the window of the parlor as he descended to his waiting carriage in the street. She sighed, thinking of the boy she most dreaded and most wanted to meet. Four, the sporting boys. The Wilbur Hotel was up North Main at Granite Street. Lizzie managed to get there without a buggy and arrived just before three as a work team was unloading water barrels from a horse-drawn cart. A large banner straddling the main entrance boasted of the hotel's finer qualities. Thal River's Wilbur Hotel, an ordinary of most excellent attributes. Today, the Boston Barkeep Furniture Corporation Conclave displays of stools and mirrors by master craftsmen. Fine lodging for transients and permanents, beer, oysters, and horsekeeping, elocution lessons by Professor Joseph Maple Esquire of New Bedford. Rooms available, restaurant attached, vigils at most excellent prices. King Darius Wilbur, proprietor, Samuel Samway's barkeep. The lobby was bustling with an influx of folk from as far away as Providence, Boston, and even from the wilds of northern New Hampshire, for the Wilbur was playing host that weekend to a convention of saloon furniture salesmen. They paraded around the lobby, these men of varnished wood and beveled mirrors, their top hats nestled on their forearms, their mustaches glistening with wax, their rattling wives beside them. In the center of the lobby was a large casket, presumably filled with beer, and a burly bartender in a bleached cloth smock was handing out samples in hardwood mugs. Lizzie was surprised to see her father wandering the crowd, not particularly connected to anyone, but occasionally giving a grim nod to a passing gentleman. He twitched imperceptibly as his daughter appeared before him, planting her parasol firmly between her feet. Father, I did not think that you took an interest in the latest fashions in bar stools. Andrew twisted up his brows. I am merely memorizing the faces. They are competition, you know. But what brings you to the Wilbur daughter? Certainly you have not been seized with the desire to sample Master Samway's homemade hops. No, father, I am on a case. That nonsense business you started. I sincerely hope that you are being paid well for your troubles. A penny worked for is a penny in the pocket. I wouldn't have it any other way. Lizzie smiled as the nearby town hall clock told three o'clock. A thin, beardless bellboy in a small hotel jacket approached Lizzie. Miss Borden, he asked in a voice crackling with adolescence, as if he were growing upwards before her very eyes. He handed her a note which she unfolded. Noticing her father staring at her intently, she reached into her purse and pulled out a coin which she tossed to the grinning bellboy. Here you are, my hard-working lad, a penny from my pocket. He hopped away merrily as Andrew scowled at her wasteful habit. Room 209, she read, and then bade her father adieu with a tilt of her head. She headed for the staircase, leaving Andrew Borden fish-mouthed. My, my, my own daughter, not yet eighteen, he stammered unescorted to an upstairs room. What more horrors can this modern world bring? As Andrew turned to leave, he spied in the corner of the lobby three young boys dressed in lean, long broadcoats, watch chains and high boots, laughing and spitting their cigar smoke into the choked air. Two of them were fitted out in bowler hats, 
and the tall, lanky leader in the middle was balanced under a tall opera hat that served to exaggerate his height. It was the sporting boys, the nattering nabobs of Fall River, grinning and roaring with chummy ostentation. Andrew noticed that as Lizzie ascended the staircase, the sporting boys were poking each other and pointing in her direction, their eyes filled with boyish leers. They were commenting upon Lizzie's elegantly draped posterior as it sashayed up the staircase, much to their amusement. Their thin leader pumped his legs up and down as if he were a strutting rooster. Boys, he chortled, need we neglect Miss Lizzie Borden of Second Street and the fine young ham she's leaving behind for our viewing pleasure? The boys roared. Get out me tape measure, me skenchbacks, one of them shouted. My, what gazing stock! She'd make a good Bowery gal at dragon time, I mind you, the leader shouted. Andrew bit his lips and took a few awkward strides across the lobby to where the sporting boys were posturing, staring them down as their laughter subsided. The leader in the opera hat patted his chest. Andrew Borden, I believe, he said proudly. Way you be, Andrew bellowed. Your countenance is vaguely familiar. The boy tipped his stove pipe and grinned. Frank Rivers, how may I be of service? I have heard of you, Rivers, Andrew growled. You and your associates here are mere sensualists. But I'm not afraid of your secret language and your fancy airs, and I am appalled by your rendezvous with women of fallen characters. Your libertine antics may go over in fancy cities, but not in Fall River. This town is full of respectable folk. Be gone immediately and take your rabble with you. The smile on River's face was defiant. He tossed a side glance to his two companions, who seemed to be hovering around his facial expressions, looking for guidance. Then he plastered down his soap locks, stepped forward, and leaned in towards Andrew's sinking eyes. No time for curtain lectures. I have a right to be in this public place, he said wickedly. I paid my coins for a room, and so did my boys here. And don't go apple-bonking our fezzle talk. We adopted it right from Paradise Square in Manhattan Island, and it's proper for all our skenchbacks. Andrew raised a straining fist. No matter where you obtained your wicked speech, I cannot allow your vulgar remarks touching my daughter. The thin, wobbly-eyed boy next to Frank Rivers stepped forward. Hi, hi, cousin. Oh, Frank here won't be remarking anything touching your daughter before he can remark on anything worth touching. <laughs> Andrew's head went hot and he shook a curled fist. Don't go near my Lizzie or... His eyes turned red with anger as he bellowed. Or I'll twist off your heads. And then, having expended his courage and energy... Andrew seemed to vanish into the air, only to reform at the center of the lobby, heading towards the street. Frank Rivers turned to his chuckling companions and smirked. I am him, boys, he howled. I am trembling in my boots. <laughs> At his lead, they broke into laughter as Andrew disappeared between the endless displays of barstools and spittoons. Five, deductions and romance. At the top of the staircase, Lizzie found herself looking down a long hallway that stretched southward between two parallel rows of doors. Halfway down, a man in a dark brown suit sat on a stool slanting backwards, humming wistfully to himself. As Lizzie alighted onto the landing, he straightened up 
then scrambled to his feet and respectfully removed his hat. He was a large bear of a man, middle-aged and paunchy. His mouth was obscured by a drooping mustache. He wore a long, dark, great coat that seemed unseasonal and was stained with the dust of the road. Miss, he said, blinking at her. Are you the detective from Pinkerton's? Lizzie asked. Pinkerton, miss, he said proudly. I don't believe I catch your meaning. The name's Pinkerton, miss. Fred Pinkerton of Pinkerton Brothers, private security firm. I see. Your name does inspire confidence, Lizzie said, chuckling lightly into her gloved hand. The French boy is waiting, he announced. On the door paneling behind him were the gilt numbers 209. With a soft touch, Lizzie pushed the door open and stepped inside. The room was dark and stuffy. Only a few beams of sunlight slanting through the closed shutters enabled her to see a shadowy man standing in the corner. At first she considered her situation to be one of immediate danger. Alone in a hotel room, with a stranger who had not yet identified himself? After all, this was the room where the Russian inventor had been scandalized. But trusting in the delicacy of the moment, she swung the door shut behind her. The shadow moved into a shaft of sunlight, and Lizzie recognized immediately the bespoken Seville Row suit jacket, the youthful attempt at a military mustache, the twinkling eyes, even the West Indies Bay rum that danced in the air between them, whispered the name and title, André Louis Jacques de Camp, the Vicomte de Rien. I know you she said, remembering her father's ominous words about André's sporting boy lifestyle. Why would the comp send her into such a dangerous position? I know you too, Lisbeth Andrew Borden, André said with slight merriment. I assure you that there is no danger here. Be at ease and join me in solving this wretchedly complicated and ever-deepening puzzle. Lizzie's breathing came more easily. His voice was fine and equally well-mannered. This comforted her. The name is Lizzie, she corrected him. Then Lizzie shall it be, he pointed toward the brass bed and the carpeted floor. Mais bien sûr, this is indeed a strange field upon which we are now treading. Here we have a room where a crime took place. A man was assaulted, and something was stolen from him. What do you see in this room, Lizzie Borden? What scenarios can you deduce from the remains of Monsieur Chikorov? With a daring flourish, Andre drew back the shutters and let the bright sunlight flood the room. Lizzie was suddenly overwhelmed with an intense amount of detail. She paused, her fingers to her chin, and peered about. Then, while Andre stood at attention with a wry smile, she perambulated the length and breadth of it, peering into corners, examining surfaces, bending her knees to see beneath the furniture. She picked up nothing, but examined everything, maneuvering her body to change her line of sight before cuspidors, bedposts, cabinets, and the writing desk. She sat in a chair, smelled a bouquet of flowers in a vase on the dressing table, cast a winking eye at some famed pictures on the mantel, waved her fingers over a clump of charred wood in the fireplace, and pressed her shoes heavily against randomly selected floorboards. She nosed through the clothing lying on the rumpled bedsheets and the heaps of linen lying on the floor. A pile of papers in the wastebasket occupied her attention for several moments. Lastly, she inspected a painting that hung upon the southern wall, a copy of a rustic scene by Poussin of several shepherds gathered about a stone tomb. The painting stared back at her with an unsettling feeling of mutual fascination. She came back to the center of the room and stood proudly before André. I have comprised a scenario, 
she proclaimed. For your amusement, I shall state it. Andre gave her a permissive wave of his hand. I did not know the name of the Russian until you just uttered it, she said, but I can say with confidence that he is a proud man with a wealthy family that has recently come upon hard times. He was forced into the business of selling mill technology by the unfortunate death of his wife, which has left him with two small children to support. Andre stared blankly at her. Go on, he said. He was in this room for two days before his unfortunate assault. During that time, he indulged in real estate speculation. No doubt he felt that migrating to America and bringing his children to Fall River would provide them with a future that cannot be realized in Tsarist Russia. He also sees Fall River as an excellent town for his new bride-to-be, since her career as an equestrian acrobat has come to a very tragic end. Excellent, Andre said with a reserved smile. I cannot imagine how you perceived many of the details in that portrait, but I did witness you examining the postcard upon the dressing table from the Louis Sawyer Circus, with the inscription from Marie confessing in French her deepest love, and the prospects that await her in America. Lizzie nodded toward the dresser. Moreover, the clothing that you had laid upon the bed and the charming but sad bouquet of flowers on the writing desk have provided me the opportunity to reconstruct his recent past. As for the clothing, the fine quality of the suit shows a man of some means, but it has in the past year, been washed so often its colors have faded, showing a recent downturning of his luck, no doubt happening simultaneously with the passing of his dear wife. What does the bouquet tell you? Through a correspondence course with the Ophelia Society of Boston, I had the opportunity to study the fine art of florigraphy and floral management with parlors and sitting rooms. After completing the home guide to the secret language of flowers, I had trained my eye to perceive the elegant messages that were being scripted within the combination of floral arrangements. Chakorov, being from St. Petersburg, takes a very romantic European approach to this art. In this bouquet, he has blended together crimson tea roses that show a melancholy loss, something that he has vowed never to forget. The presence of the scarlet nasturtiums led me to believe that there was a military death, perhaps a brother in the Bulgarian campaign. But the nasturtium also symbolizes patriotism, perhaps reflecting a period after the profound loss where he attempted to regain his emotional composure through world affairs. The pheasant eyes and blue periwinkles that are so mournfully laced at the corners, show a sorrowful remembrance that his feelings, once so potent and devastated, were mellowing into a sublime melancholy. The white poppies whisper of a striving for forgetfulness, a moving on, so to speak. So far, Andre confirmed, this is all correct, as you Americans are so fond of saying. What about the equestrian bride-to-be? Ah, the full-blown red rose at the center that blooms above the rest speaks loudly of a return of hope and the dawning of a new happiness after a long sojourn in a wilderness. No doubt a wilderness of a mental nature. One can only guess that Chaikarov has felt a new love dawn. The enthusiastic postcard from the French horsewoman that bespeaks a life together in America fulfills all my florographic interpretations. And the real estate speculation? The caked mud on his boots is peculiar to a lot that is being developed just around the corner from Anawan Street, one that Mr. Southern Miller has put up for sale. Near this lot is a tobacco shop that sells the Louisiana Perrick. 
that has a moist vinegary smell, the same smell that hangs so pungent in the air about us. No doubt the property came to his attention on one of his trips to obtain his treasured tobacco, and he managed to get access to the property through the builder's agent. He may have been strolling for relaxation and entered the property out of mere curiosity. Ah, but his beloved Marie claims that she will be very happy in America. There are also the three books on the bureau, clearly obtained from the Stone Street Lending Library. One of them, a French-English lexicon. Another, a picture book of famous horses of North America. And the last, a treatise on the domestication of the recently married couple of Professor Horatio Tiverton of Swansea. Finally, his wastebasket contains papers where he had been practicing his English letters, writing out phrases like, My dear sir, which way are the horse stables? And what are the most excellent children's schools in this neighborhood? This shows me clearly that he was contemplating the rebuilding of his family with the French equestrian woman and his orphan children right here in Fall River. Andre clapped his hands in rhythm to a hearty laugh. I can tell you with great confidence, Lisbeth, and may I be permitted to call you Lisbeth? It is far more suited to your dignity and grace that your portrait of Monsieur the Russian is perfection itself, a small gem of analytical reasoning that does you very proud. But alas, such details are useless when it comes to solving this riddle, for here we have a room where no intruder entered before the infamous deed, and no intruder exited. It is as if the Russian were attacked by un fantôme of his own imagination. I don't understand, Lizzie frowned. Behold, the testimony of the security agent. Andrew went to the door and rapped three times in quick succession. A moment later, the large, mustachioed man from the corridor entered awkwardly at a glacial pace, nodding respectfully at Andre and Lizzie in turn. Miss, he said, Mr. Pinkerton, I have a few questions about the evening before last, Lizzie stated. I believe you were on duty when this deplorable theft occurred. Would you mind relating your version of the affair? He rubbed his chin as if trying to stir memory. I'm not a man of very many words, he said, but I can oblige if it will help bring about a conclusion. There will most certainly, Andre said defiantly, be a conclusion, Monsieur Pinkerton. By your leave, well, it was before all this barstool nonsense. Hardly anyone was occupying this second floor, but them sporting boys that made all the commotion o' nights with their fancy girls about. I was at my post at ten o'clock. I remember one of the girls yelling down the hall that a gentleman caller needed a bowl of hot water. Then all the doors were shut and everything was quiet. King Darius had turned down the lamps and you could hear all that slumbered snoring along the corridor. Fall River, descending into twilight, Lizzie said softly. Yes, miss, and that's when I do confess a profound lapse of character. I'm almost afeard to lose my commission if I relate what I have to tell. You need not. I can guess. You were imbibing. At my post, it is true. The intent was to keep the fire going inside me, because the dark night in a hotel corridor can be mighty cold, despite the summer. I'm not a vain man, but this drinking is one act I do fear the judgment upon, especially considering its sequel. Andre raised an assuring hand. You need not fear prosecution, since my father did determine that the whiskey was drugged. Drugged it was. After just a few sips, I felt myself slipping off. 
but I am a stubborn man as well. I fought it all the way. On the exterior, you might have just witnessed a big oaf of a man snoring in his boots. But from the interior angle, I was wrestling with mighty demons. And I do declare, miss, I won the battle. I forced myself awake. How long was your interval? I can't rightly say, but it seemed enough for someone to have filched the key in my jacket pocket and then slipped by me into this ear room to do his immoral deed. When I realized what had been done, I got to my feet, roared almighty hellfire, and ripped this door nearly off its hinges to find the Russian fellow lying on the floor with his southern exposure aiming out as bare as a babe's. Did you raise an alarm to the desk clerk? Immediately, miss. I figured the footpad was on his way out the front door of the hotel, so I bounded down the steps. Are there any other steps down to the lobby? None, miss. Those are the only ones from the second floor, and I blocked it with my girth the whole time. Then King Darius called the constabulary, and I went upstairs to help preserve the Russian fellow's dignity. How long before the police came? About three minutes, by my reckoning. And they filled this room. They knew this was an international affair, although none of us, including myself, know the truth behind it. Something about foreign wars. I don't rightly care about those crazy tangles. As long as my pay is regular, I keep my nose out of it. Leave it to the fancy politicos. How long were the police here? Oh, about an hour, and then my brother Fred came to relieve me. Your brother's name is also Fred? My daddy did have a hankering for that name, and when we came out twins, it seemed only right to consider us as one unit. I see. So Fred, your brother, took the second watch. Right so, and we have alternated since at twelve-hour intervals. I told Fred to keep a right smart watch and to take no drink in fear it would mean the death of his ambitions. What about the Russian? Where was he taken? Andre answered. There was no one can get at him. Needless to say, he does not wish to be interrogated. You can learn nothing from him, for he remembers nothing, but has a distinct soreness that may take some time to overcome. Lizzie nodded. I understand. Mr. Pinkerton, are you absolutely sure you saw no one leave this room? None, miss, unless the fiend slipped out before I had awoken myself. But no one downstairs saw any man excepting myself come down those stairs. It's as if the assailant appeared from thin air and vanished into likewise. And the desk clerk, he saw no one go up shortly before the striking of ten? No one, Andre added. It seems as if the Russian attacker was a passing shadow of no substance. Pinkerton huffed. No shadow could have taken the key from my pocket or pulled the Russian fellow off his bed to separate him from his night pants. There was flesh and blood involved, I assure you of that. Lizzie put her two forefingers to her chin and drew in deep breath. She glanced about the room, carefully examining the walls, and then before her silent observers walked up and down, counting her steps, after a few perambulations, she turned to Pinkerton and said sternly, I must ask you to stand guard over this room at all costs, to make sure that no one enters or leaves without your awareness. His mustache dipped with his face in agreement. I shall, miss, except in at various times of the day or night I may be my own brother. We do take turns and be in that 
collectively we look like one person staring into a mirror, no one really cares if we swap out to give each other a chance to catch some snores, you understand. Understood, she concluded, and then darted for the door, exiting into the hallway. Andre followed her out to find her walking a straight line along the corridor, pausing before each door. Then she turned about and came back, carefully putting one foot before the other. Curious, she said, leaning over to make sure the security guard had not followed them into the hallway. Does he know about the passery? Not a bit. Does he know about, does he know about the Arcady ring? Even less. Good, Lizzie said with a nod. Let's keep it that way. What do you know about the ring? It is the signet of the Arcady Society. According to the locals that I have interrogated, it is the secret club of the sporting boys. Despite my father's fears that they are anarchists and assassins, I believe it merely to be a small group of rowdy youths who sample the opiates of the Orient and women of low character with equal impunity. Lizzie furrowed her brow. The same sporting boys who were present here at the time of the affair. The same. Do you wish to talk to them yourself? No. For now, I'd like to see the desk clerk, this King Darius that everyone is talking about. He may hold an important key to this puzzle. I believe he is in the lobby, tending to the conclave, Andre pushed past her and led her down the steps towards the lobby. Six. King Darius's Secret Chamber King Darius Wilbur was a man buried under burdensome mustaches that demanded far more energy and labor to keep in their pristine state than any one man could be expected to produce. Nonetheless, he wore his whiskers proudly and gave one the impression, as one talked to him, that his head was in the midst of being swallowed by them. Lizzie, facing him directly across the main desk of the Wilbur's lobby, experiencing the full impact of his face in the slanting sunlight, found herself visibly lost in his whiskers' magnificence. It had been observed by many that the Wilbur Hotel, a recently prospering concern, was growing in exponential proportion to King Darius's facial masterpiece and that local speculators feared that the further expansion of his business would result in the complete structural collapse of his head, which was itself already buried under the weight of his facial hair. Beyond this peculiar trait, he was jovial enough, and he seemed eager to provide Lizzie with information. I am quite alarmed, he confessed, that such intrigue would go on under my roof. I did not think that the Russian would be at such risk in my own establishment, I dare say. I now do. And you saw no one go up those stairs at ten on the clock, or slightly before? His eyes hovered together near his nose. No, Miss Borden, I was keeping watch, being mindful of that Rivers boy and his shameless carryings on with the harlot. Miss Jewett, They've been keeping company here for quite some time, and always in the same room. God's teeth, but I dare say Rivers was enraged when the Russian fellow came to town. Rivers? Why would he be upset about the Russian? Because he took his room, he did. Lizzie leaned forward, quite drawn in by his statement. You are telling me that room 209 is usually occupied by Frank Rivers and his fancy girl? The mustaches bobbed with the face. Dare say I do. It was a mighty strange manner in which it transpired. I had the Russian fellow booked by order of the French court into a right proper room, one that hadn't been darkened in spirit by these nattering nabobs. I had him in the Commonwealth suite, 
and was prepared to dandy him up with all sorts of linens and soaps. But at the last minute, a messenger boy comes from the commons house. Seems like there was a mix-up, a right proper one, and personages unknown have insisted that the Russian be lodged in 209. Who was I to question it? I think to myself I did. The letter came with all sorts of city seals. I didn't know this fellow's business, but I know if a French count is involved and orders come from the commons house, then who am I, Darius Wilbur, who possesses nothing but a humble ordinary of quality and stupefying face brushes to question the properly embossed seals and signatures? Do you have the letter? Lizzie asked anxiously. King Darius poked his face about under the desk, pulling up some boxes and peering into some sliding drawers. God's wounds, but I know it's here somewhere. His eyes brightened, and he brought up a folded paper. After snapping it open, he handed it to Lizzie, who took one glance at it, then handed it back. It's a forgery, she observed. It's not from the commons house. Look at the paper. Tan, mere butcher paper. And the signature says Larson E. Whipsnade. Who do you know in this city with the name Whipsnade? King Darius's mustaches were trembling as if they had their own nervous system. I feel the fool I do. Like if God has a fool all his own, it would be me. Andre took the paper from Lizzie and let out a small chuckle. Chikorov was being set up for thievery. They needed him in that room. Lizzie peered up at the ceiling, measuring with her eyes. Mr. Wilbur, she asked, stepping back to get a cleaner view of the expanse of molding. Would you say that room 209 is just about there? Right near that fancy plaster cornucopia? coming forth from the ceiling above? Sounds about right. And how many feet would you say between that cornucopia and the fancy swirls by the southern face? Looks to be about two or three feet, no more or less, but I can't reckon without climbing up there with a mason's rule. Is there another room between 209 and the southern face? Not that I know of. But I do believe there's crawl spaces all over the building. That's where the weirds reside. The weirds? Andre puzzled. Ah, pay no attention to my fired imaginations. It's a folly of my besotted brain. Too much mustache wax, I presume. But there are strange noises at nights, especially since the Russian fellow's been pinched. From my post, I hear the thumping and the cursing. Cursing? More like the wailing of a lost spirit. I can't bring myself to go searching the corridors. Perhaps the night watch Fred would be able to tell you. Perhaps it's some suicide from long ago who's up there wandering to find his closure. Not being a spiritualist, Lizzie announced, I would sooner think it was just an intruder walking about. But the guests are all accounted for, they are, Darius said. Believe you me. Andre produced a small calling card that had a light trace of perfume. King Darius, you have given us valuable information. Right so, the bewhiskered manager beamed. When you decipher any of its meaning, let me know what it was that I did tell you for I'll be danged if it makes sense to me right now. We will, and if anything of interest comes up, here is my card. Darius took the card just as a horde of furniture men stormed the desk, all demanding their telegrams and directions to the nearest saloons. Lizzie and Andre stepped to the side, her eyes practically glued to the ceiling. Her lips were moving silently, as if she were counting. You think there's an extra room, Andre said. 
But you can clearly see from the corridor that 209 is at the southern end of the building. She took her gaze from the ceiling. Oh, Andre, this is foul play indeed. For now we have to prepare ourselves for a most unpleasant encounter. Bring me to the sporting boys. Andre directed her towards the dining room from where bellowed forth a loud strain of youthful, impetuous voices. 7. Lizzie Gets Fuzzled Frank Rivers and his sporting boys were having their mid-afternoon cigars in the attached dining hall behind the Wilbur's lobby. They sat at their usual table along the western wall before large paneled windows, Frank in his tall opera hat flanked by two bowler-hatted youths looking like a chimney rising above two slag heaps. A flustered waiter was racing back and forth bringing them victuals while they stamped their fireman boots and howled racy ballads. A furniture salesman at a nearby table, distracted by the boy's obnoxious hoots, boldly shouted, Please be quiet! Decent people are trying to digest! Chase them, boys, Frank said to his crew. They're envious of our crapulous folk who live by our own tables of morality. <laughs> But I say stock jobbers be they. The salesman huffed and nervously went back to his coffee, just as Lizzie Borden and Andre de Camp entered the hall. As if on cue, the sporting boys quieted down, stifling their laughs and straightening their legs under their table. Frank Rivers, Andre said with a bow. Miss Borden and I require a few moments of your time, if you would allow. Ha! Ha! The sporting boy proclaimed. It would be our honor to host such a fine lady and her dandified beau at our table. Chaz and Buster here won't mind, will you, my gutter bloods? Nah, Buster explained. Ladies of quality are always welcome to take Ma Wallop with us. <laughs> Rivers raised his cane and waved it delicately toward the two chairs opposite him and his gang. As Lizzie and Andre took their seats, Rivers stuffed his cigar into his mouth, removing his stovepipe hat to reveal garishly plastered soap locks running down the sides of his scalp. He spat a wad of saliva into his hand and ran his palm along the glistening locks. As he replaced his hat, Lizzie felt a displeasing stir in her stomach. Have a go at us, Lizzie Borden of Second Street, Frank said. If we're cold tooth enough for you. <laughs> I could judge that a bit more for myself if I knew what cold tooth was. Lizzie said, smiling. But for the moment, I'd like to bring your attention to the evening before last. Chaz let out a rude laugh. Ha! That's the night the Ivan Sizer got bully whacked in the renterfuge. <laughs> Frank grimaced. Now, now, my skenchback, don't go quanking out our guests with our fuzzle talk for in her gumbling through she may take beastly interpretations. Miss Lizzie, re-enterfuge is the room I keep with my prancing pony. I got tumbled by that mustached jarkman who runs this hovel. One day I'll divorce him from his facial for that bum wash. He gave the Russian your room. Lizzie said plainly, the room you frequent with your whore, Sarah Jewett. Frank jumped in his seat and glanced about. Don't you go speaking it plain like. There's bound to be a bit of scandal brothen by local mollifuffs. Andre leaned in close to Lizzie. From the German word mal, meaning speech, and fuffen, meaning to blow. 
literally someone who blows speech. I suspect he fears gossip. My, Frank chortled. You are indeed bent upon deciphering us, ain't ya? Yes, Frank Rivers, we are, Lizzie said, her patience wearing thin. You can hide behind all your fuzzle talk, but you can't get away from suspicion. And when a crime is committed within yards of your sleeping quarters, indeed within a room to which you have a key, your account of the affair is of great interest to those trying to find the conclusion of this affair. A shadow fell across Frank's face as a cloud interrupted the sunlight. You want to know the unfarded truth, he said calmly, unmystified by false beauties. Well, I'll be the first to admit I'm a scoundrel of a carpet knight. Many a fancy girl has fallen under my glamour. But that doesn't make me a thief. One may hazard from my fuzzle talk and sport in ways that I don't have a gall of bitterness within me, that I would just as soon steal the metal from my dying grandmother's teeth for a few tankards and a romp with a tweeny maid. Yes, I have my own morality tables that I draw upon, but I do have my limits and I don't go bullywhacking gentlemen, even if they are Ivan Sizers. I don't go filching, and I don't play hunt the whistle, and I don't send any old rake juggler off to Fiddler's Green for lampoons. What do you know about that night? Lizzie said, ignoring his obscurity. What did you hear and see touching this affair? Pinkerton flonker, Frank spat. He was guzzled and fell to sonorating. We heard his guzzle moans, and then the next we heard, he was all in a twee over it and went stomping to the jarkman. Next we know the badgers are all about, and there's talk of this Ivan Sizer being glorged. Yeah, said Chaz, glorged by the insensible. You ever hear such crap? <laughs> so, who you got testifying? Drunkard pinks and bullywhacking ghosts, Frank said with a gentle nod to his gutter bloods. You ever hear such mulch before? So, what do you think occurred that night? Lizzie asked. This is my reconstruction. The big office, pinks, had some malifluffs trinkling on the Ivan and knew his habits. So they waited till after dragon time, and all the boys and gals be in their stables for billywinks. Then they pulled a filch party on the old pink and the sizer. They got more than one maw hole to climb in, since the boys liked to viz their sport. He held up his left hand, the thumb and forefinger tips pressed together, poked an eye through the ring, and grinned. Who doesn't like to viz a bit of the acrobatics? Lizzie was taken aback by his garish gesture. But you didn't answer my question, she added. What did you hear and see? Frank leaned forward, his brows pressing together. I was strumming aloft at the time and wasn't quite paying apple bunkers to an Ivan and a pink who was sonorating a half hallway apart from my stable. Despite what you may hazard in your think hole, my ears ain't quite that big and my eye stalks ain't that protruded. So you got a bit of a problem distance-wise. There was a long pause while Frank Rivers and Lizzie Borden sat locked in a frozen state, their eyes pressed together over the space between them. Then... Lizzie broke the moment with a small, crooked smile. I think I've had enough information, Mr. Rivers. I take my leave, knowing that the prostitute, Sarah Jewett, is safe in the custody of a boy who considers her a prancing pony and names the hour she is taken to her stable 
as dragging time, and that courtship and courtesy must take a holiday to Billy Winks. I only hope that when I am of age to take a husband, he would use less flowery imagery to portray his affections for me. Frank touched his cane handle to his forehead. Pleased to have educated you, Miss Lizzie. Since we were educated at different high schools, I'm glad we can still understand each other. Lizzie and Andre got to their feet. As they were leaving the dining hall, she could hear the snorts and sneers behind them. The flustered waiter was just entering with a full silver tray of ma wallop. What did you divine from that parody of a conversation? Andre asked. Andre asked Lizzie as they slowly strolled across the Wilbur's lobby. Lizzie laughed nervously. It is comforting to know that he draws the line at playing Hunt the Whistle. I was beginning to fear for the female population of Bristol County. Andre gave a dismissive wave. They are mere pretenders, just wealthy children who are too lazy to adopt their father's enterprises. They fashion their lifestyles after the New York City gangs who haunt Five Points and the Bowery. There is much suspicion here. Not necessarily. Lizzie added dramatically. I don't suppose you noticed his left hand. When the sunlight hit at the right angle, I could clearly see the skin on his fingers. Andre clicked his fingers. The Arcady ring! I did not even think to look. Lizzie reached into her purse and brought forth the signet which she held up for Andre's perusal. Your father let me have it. I was thinking of producing it for Mr. Rivers' astonishment, but felt best to keep it discreet. Nonetheless, there was no discoloration upon his fingers. I do not believe this to be his ring. Andre stared at it, his jaw clenched. Does something strike you? Lizzie asked. No, he said, rubbing his temple. Only a headache. Shall we promenade down street? It is a striking August day, and I would very much like to know you better, Miss Lisbeth Borden. 8. Lisbeth of Light As the sun sank behind the gently rolling contours of Swansea, beyond the river and the moving barges of Bale, Lizzie and Andre walked along the dockside of the Troy manufacturing buildings. Already stars were beginning to appear in the firmament as the sun lowered beyond the horizon. I am sorry, Lizzie said humbly, that I am so flustered. Whenever I see those youths, their futures filled with promise and possibilities, their family offering them resources and capital, instead turning toward a wasteful life of mere libertinage and sensuality. I cannot feel but despair for the next generation. I believe, Andre said, Frank Rivers is a nephew to Wellington Rivers, the paper mill tycoon. Needless to say, he has been disinherited. The boy is living upon the good graces of an aunt, who is too old and senile to know what he is doing with her money. I still declare that he is our most likely suspect. It would explain why no one saw the thief come or go from the lobby. Rivers would have had to merely slip back into his room after the robbery, thus giving the impression that the thief had vanished into thin air. I cannot be fully sure, but the real thief took great care to put suspicion on Rivers and his boys. The ring was so placed to further that suspicion. Andre shrugged indifferently. What about the Pinkertons? Although my father puts enormous trust in them, there is no working man that cannot be bought if the price is high enough. No man is above perfidy, Lizzie agreed but my instincts tell me that the real culprit has yet to reveal his face to us. Such a pity, 
since your father needs a conclusion by the day after tomorrow, Andre stopped and stared upwards into the darkening horizon. My father, he sighed, for him it is all about money, I believe. Don't listen to his nonsense about the balance of power in Europe and anarchists lurking in the shadows. The man is merely concerned for his own stock portfolio. Is that such a crime? Lizzie asked. Andre was about to answer, but then he pointed toward a twinkling star. When I look upon that sky, he mused, I realize we are but dust, mere motes of dust compared to the vast wheels of creation. As a small boy, I would walk by twilight in the hills of rien le chateau past the old castles and the haunted graveyards, and watch the stars appear one by one, like celestial candles on some vast birthday cake. Then I would lie on my back in the midst of a field and let the great spiral move about me. I would fix my gaze on one particular star, and throughout the night notice how it would spin about as if on the rim of a perfect wheel. And I would feel as if I were pinned to the center and that all of creation was whirling about me. At moments like those, my father and all his fortune would seem so inconsequential, like a forgotten dream that once had so much importance but now was just a shard of memory. Lizzie watched his face closely as he spoke. You certainly have your thoughts lifted above the daily affairs, she answered. I did not think a man of your means and title would think of anything but commerce and management of property. Perhaps it is the soil of my native land, he said. There is mystery in its deep veins. It makes one yearn for something beyond the veil of daily sorrows. I am at heart a poet. Lizzie sighed. You are very different from any man I have ever known. I have only known men like my father, and he is so very different from your own. My father never had a title and his wealth is so small compared with your family's grand fortune. My father stands in relation to your father, as we all do to the big wheel you point out in the sky. There is hierarchy indeed in this vast creation. Andre's voice grew thin and modest. But, Lisbeth, I see those stars reflected in your eyes. So... By mirroring the light from above, you are becoming one with it. And then the modest Lisbeth, who feels so unimportant, is now the most exquisite being that exists. Lizzie blushed. I wouldn't go so far. I'm just a girl from a small family. There's nothing special about me. But we are all stars. Andre announced, lifting up a hand towards the heavens. We twinkle on the great wheel of life, and we all move together in a perfect circle. I have written a poem to that effect. I call my composition Lisbeth of Light. A smile curled on her lips. Why, that's my name, he nodded in the affirmative and began his recital. I call the bold words to draw your breath and to drum a beat on your warm heart. I call upon life and its handmaiden death to give our child its earth-born dart. This child formed from the air betwixt us that takes a first cry from the sorrows of life, from the darkness of spirit that surrounds us, but muse a bold yes in the face of the strife against grey evening. The dawn weaves its charm, and something billows on the horizon's lip. Tis the hope and the beauty and the inner calm that we have won and must never slip. 
So if verse be the beating pulse that fashions a heart that shall sing strong and bright, let me sing on through the daybreak that passes across my eternal Lisbeth of light. Paralyzed silence fell between them. Andre stood by Lizzie's side, his shoulder barely touching her. She could feel the heat through the fabric of a chill transported along the length of her trembling body. When did you compose this poem? Lizzie asked, her face turning red. After seeing you at your church this Saturday past, I did not think that you had noticed me. I asked my father who you may be, and he answered, That is Andre J. Borden's younger daughter. She is a clever, wise, and commanding girl. She runs her own consulting business and has trapped several wrongdoers and corrected many harms to common people. She is indeed a flower of a girl in the midst of a rough crop. And then I knew that I had found the one girl in Fall River in whom I could find a trustworthy soul. I am flattered indeed. Lizzie blushed. She was about to say more, but could not find the words. Do you believe, Lisbeth Borden, Andre asked, that perhaps our ancestors on the lush fields of Carcassonne enjoyed each other's company as we are enjoying ourselves on this most enchanted evening? She was stunned, standing frozen without speech fearing to breathe. Perhaps they did, Andre continued, and perhaps they took of the dark blood of the soil, tasting together the richness of the earth into which they were born and into which they shall pass. Perhaps a Baudin and a Duchamp lay together under the mysterious stars and held hands as I hold yours and she felt a soft fluttering about her fingers, and then they were pressed together. Lizzie stiffened and found that she was no longer breathing, which embarrassed her, and Andre smiled. You have nothing to fear, he said peacefully. I am a perfect gentilhomme. And he lifted her palm into the air and took a slight bow in her direction. There is beauty in you she said in a bare whisper. Inwardly, she blessed the darkness for hiding her blushes. In the long distance, the wail of a bale barge sang across the cloudy darkness like a leviathan of the deep calling for its home waters. Andre's face was only lightly illuminated by the hanging lamps, but she could see his deep eyes sparkling with the waters below as the moonlight reflected upwards toward the pier. There were never eyes more beautiful, she thought, nor a face so noble. Lizzie pressed her free hand to her cheek to catch her tears. You are not a sporting boy at all, my dear Andre, she said. You are a melancholy soul of light. Nine, a sudden revelation. At breakfast the next morning, Andrew Jackson Borden sat with his family at his dining room table, nibbling on some leftover codfish balls, his bead-like eyes staring distantly to the wallpaper as if he were contemplating the insensible. Abby Borden, seated near him, inhaling a cup of coffee and chewing gustily on a molasses cookie, seemed afraid to draw his attention toward the present moment while Emma stirred restlessly upon some difficult secret that was bubbling inside her, causing her to shift her posture every few moments, a gesture accompanied by uncomfortable sighs. Lizzie, like her father, sat in a grim trance, her utensil barely grazing her dish. Only the Irish maid showed signs of animation, flittering in and out of the kitchen with the various courses of their breakfast. "'What is this gloom that descends on us today?' said Abby finally. "'It is like being seated at a funeral viewing.' 
My dear Andrew, where is your mind wandering? What? he said, his eyes jerking back to the present. My apologies, Mrs. Borden. I was trying to remember Tobias Allsworth. I cannot imagine what ill tidings he harbors towards me. Allsworth, Abby frowned. That's the cloth doffer that you evicted for non-payment of rent. I can't imagine what glad tidings he would harbor towards you. I told you that being so strict with him over one month's rent was not good for your reputation. I was merely protecting my property rights, Andrew said with a start. That Allsworth was particularly unsavory. He slurped at his stew, staining his beard. I cannot abide slackards and layabouts. That slackard, shouted Emma, rising to her feet, has disappeared from the face of the earth. There was a harsh moment of silence, broken by Lizzie coughing delicately into her hand. It's true, father, Emma continued. I have heard word from my contacts down the street that Tobias Allsworth has vanished. Last Monday morning, he was seen wandering down by the Durfee Mill, and at noon his boots were found by the side of the Quikishan. His wife and his seven children are living in a state of despondent impecuniousness. They should have considered themselves fortunate when they let the place, Andrew sputtered. It is not my concern. Heartless man, Emma muttered. You don't know their fortunes both before they let from you and after their cruel eviction. You don't know the vagaries that have befallen them. I do know, Andrew said, pointing a spoon towards his elder daughter, that I have been fined by the bank for late payment of the mortgage. Allsworth doesn't give a fig for that, nor should I care a fig for his dilemma. The man is dead, Emma howled and then fled toward the door, her hands moving toward her face. She collided with the maid who was entering with a tray of molasses cookies. Out of my way, Maggie, she shouted, and a moment later her feet were heard clomping up the front stairs. Flustered, the maid ran back into the kitchen. Abby patted the table with her palms. Well, Andrew, she said solemnly, you have certainly topped the program this time. I have never heard such disregard for another man's plight. Bah! I have my rights. Landlords have rights. But you have no poetry, Lizzie said suddenly. Huh? What? Andrew sputtered. What kind of nonsense do you speak? You see no lights in my eyes, Lizzie announced. You see no great wheel in the sky. There is only one letter separating your name from his, but the other differences are vast and deep. His blood runs with wine, yours with sawdust. Andrew looked toward Abby, as if trying to find an anchor of sanity. My daughter is speaking like the inmates at the Taunton Asylum. Abby's face went slack. I believe I know what Lizzie is saying, she said grimly. Ah, you are all insane, Andrew stammered. Well, no one knows the humiliation I felt. Spit at me in the street, he did, in front of my own people, in front of my own daughter told me to go be hanged in Arcady, whatever the devil that means. Lizzie froze, her eyes widening. What did you say? said Lizzie. He told me be hanged in Arcady. I suppose he thinks I would travel all the way to Greece to dangle myself from some fruit tree. Lizzie bolted to her feet, her arms shaking. Who was this man? Do you not know? Oh, father, I must know who he was. Tall, mustache and beard, spectacles. I don't care one jot who he is, as long as he keeps his spittle away from my brow. Lizzie ran from her table, leaving behind a full bowl of codfish stew. She pushed her way violently past the Maggie, 
who stood in the doorway staring at the remaining Bordens sitting silently at their table along the northern wall. For the love of Mike, she said merrily, did your daughters not get seized by some turned milk? You're a right queer family, I declare. 10. A Clue in the Midden Heap the stable yard behind the Wilbur was filled with the whinnying and musty smells of the clientele's beastly transports. The stable doors were wide open, and the rank orders overwhelmed Andre, forcing him to hold a fine cloth handkerchief to his nose. Lizzie's mysterious note had asked him to meet her back there at noon, and the eager anticipation that she had solved some part of the affair kept him at attention downwind of the stable's midden heap. Lizzie appeared as if from the cabinet of a stage magician, her face bright and cheery, with a calm and ease that had not existed in her the day before. Andre greeted her with a slight kiss to the back of her hand. Lisbeth, he said, which made her smile. I have good news, she announced. Another piece of this puzzle has fallen into place, and I am ready to test a hypothesis. I was hoping as much, Andre gestured toward the back door of the hotel. Shall we? As they started toward the olfactory safety of the Wilbur's interior, Lizzie's eyes narrowed in on the large and distasteful midden heap, upon which a dirty young girl in a patchwork dress clamored with an iron hook digging into the tangled mass. The girl looked up with a ferocity in her hungry face. Biddy Doran, if I'm not mistaken, Lizzie exclaimed, what are you doing far from Bishop Street and digging in that filth no less? The girl lowered her iron hook and stood erect. The man said there's gold in here. The man? What man? The man with the funny hat. He told me that I can stop my mommy being hungry if I can find her some gold. She held up an egg-shaped item that gleamed in the sunlight. He found this and said, bah, and threw it to me. He told me there's more in there if I were dog enough to scrounge for it. Bastard, Andre whispered. He reached forward and took the small ball that the girl was holding. It was the size of a walnut and looked like it had been forged roughly from tin. A small hinged top swung open to reveal a folded piece of paper inside. Lizzie reached in and grabbed it, eagerly unfolding the paper. In childish scrawl, it read, Hang be to ye to Arcady, Andrew J. Borden. Without a moment's hesitation, she stepped back into the center of the horse yard and started scanning the tall back wall of the hotel, examining each and every window and small opening. You believe it was tossed from above? Andre asked. I have been a fool, of course. The pessary did not make it to the master criminal behind this. It is still in the hotel. But this is good news. That means there is a chance of finding it. I wonder, she said with a curious twinkle in her eye. Lizzie unbuckled her purse and reached in, pulling out a large silver coin and held it forth to the small girl. Perhaps this can help with your mother's hunger. The girl stepped forward cautiously and snatched the coin, her fingers trembling as they wrapped around its circumference. Now run along and let your mother have the coin, Lizzie ordered. The girl sped from the courtyard, dust rising behind her. Lizzie held the tin pessary in her hand and peered intently at the back wall of the hotel. This is far more than I could have hoped for. This, yes, I think I know what to do. Andre, I must ask you to tell your father that I have solved the case, but you must gather together the following people. The Comte de Rien, Fred and Fred Pinkerton, King Darius Wilbur, 
Deputy Sheriff Wixton of the Bristol County Police, and Dr. Seabury Bowen. A doctor? Unless I am horribly mistaken, I believe we may need of a medical man for a delicate procedure. I trust your instinct, Lizzie Borden, girl detective. Andre de Camp is at your service. And he gracefully withdrew from the courtyard, leaving Lizzie to ponder the odorous midden heap of Bidden Doran. 11. The Weird in the Wall An hour later, a small coterie gathered in the lobby of the Wilbur, clustered about their host, King Darius Wilbur, who twirled his mustaches furiously. The Comte de Rien, clearly uncomfortable with such a public appearance, glanced about with suspicion as if he expected a bomb-hurtling anarchist to be behind every pillar and post. One of the Fred Pinkertons stood like a stone sentinel with his hanging whiskers and dusty bowler. Deputy Sheriff Wixton of Bristol County, looking very mystified, tipped his cap to Lizzie Borden and asked politely, I don't know what this is all about, but I bet it's a pretty howdy-do. Lizzie laughed. It is very simple, deputy. The Comte de Rien has had something stolen from him, and now we are going to retrieve it. I shall want you to arrest the culprit. Then you have found it, the Comte said with bated breath. Mon Dieu, you must tell me where it is without delay. I am waiting for one more personage in our little drama, a man whose role may turn out to be of great importance. Ah, I see, André, your jean fille has indeed located the good Dr. Seabury Bowen. André and Dr. Bowen came in through the front door, the expression on the doctor's face betraying as much confusion as the deputies. I have been informed you require my services, he said politely. Is someone ill? That is yet to be seen, Lizzie announced, then waved a gloved hand toward the stairway to the upper floor. Gentlemen, a few moments later they had all regrouped outside of room 209, where the other Fred Pinkerton, dressed in the same brown suit and bowler hat as his twin, stood by his wooden chair at attention. King Darius peered at him with puzzlement. Are you you, he asked, or are you your brother? I'm the other one, he replied. The entire crowd moved into the room, which was exactly as Lizzie had last seen it the previous afternoon, down to the flower bouquet on the writing desk and the French circus postcard on the dressing table. Gentlemen, she said, clapping her hands, we are now in a room where four evenings ago a robbery of great ignominy took place. A Russian inventor had a possession stolen from him as he lay unconscious, the victim of etherization. For the last 24 hours, I have been greatly puzzled over this theft. For the thief did not seem to have entered or exited the room, or at least that was the impression of the good Fred Pinkertons and King Darius Wilbur, all three of whom I consider to be men of impeccable reputation and honesty. It vexed me greatly how the thief made his escape, and I have torturously pondered every possible solution. Then it occurred to me that perhaps the thief never made his escape at all. Perhaps, and I beg your indulgence for a moment, he is still here. Everyone in the room shouted out with surprise, glancing suspiciously at their neighbor. Lizzie raised her hands to quiet them down, and I am not suggesting that anyone present in this room is the culprit. But it seems impossible, King Darius exclaimed. Do you suspect supernatural agencies? I heard the weirds and their hideous calls in the night, I did. Nay, Mr. Wilbur, 
one need not resort to supernatural explanations. I will demonstrate the source of your nocturnal weirding's calls. She reached into her purse and produced several slips of paper on which were handwritten phrases of varying lengths. She began to distribute them to her perplexed guests, keeping one for herself. Then she turned and faced the southern wall. The Poussin painting of the rustic shepherds about their tomb now seemed a bit crooked in the stark noon light. Everyone faced the wall with her. I may be wrong about this, she said, but there is no other solution. Will everyone please be so kind as to read out the phrases on the paper I have given each of you? Read the phrase with a voice pursuing dramatic emotional ranges, like an actor upon a stage at a variety saloon. The Comte de Rien looked down at his assigned script. But this is madness. What manner of words are these? Trust me, Lizzie said. Everyone stood staring at her, so she pumped her hand in the air and demonstrated in a loud and boisterous outspurt. Here's a spouter, boy! Off the bow, sprites! Rank the boom lines! After an awkward pause, the rest of the men followed her example in loud theatrical voices, as if they meant to be heard by a far-flung balcony of patrons. Abandon the house, boys! Come on, ye green skull dolts, make fireflies to the booms! Ignite the blubber works, there's a goodly trough of oil to be had! The winds are crossing swords, O oh, me hearties. Far be starboard, the spermaceti awaits. Our poolers to the boats, thar she blows. For a few moments, the men in the room raised this mighty cacophony, so much so that they began to hear feet stamping and the sound of alarm in the hallway outside. As their boisterous cries started to wind down, Lizzie egged them on. Keep at it. Don't mind the innocents. We're almost there. Andre felt absurd and was the first one to stop. Just as he was about to protest and quiet the others, there was a horrific cracking noise, and the entire wall before which they stood started to shake. The Poussin painting crashed to the floor, revealing more rose-flowered wallpaper, but dead in the center of the faint rectangle where the color had been faded by sunlight was a curious peephole, like a tiny hole in the middle of a rose petal. Then a tiny crack appeared along the edges of a long, thin, painted vine, and there was the creak of rusty hinges. Before everyone's startled eyes, a large section of the wall was pushing outwards. There was now a door where previously there had been no door, and it was swinging towards them to uncover a man-sized opening behind. The figure that bounded from the newly exposed orifice was thin, grimy, and dressed in filthy rags. His hair was wild, his eyes aglow with some feral madness. His whiskers flared out at insane angles, and his cheeks puffed as he pumped against the wooden floorboards. He tried to race toward the door, but Deputy Wixton stepped forward and grabbed him. Lord, salvage me, the man was shouting in a creaky voice. The spermaceti is spouting, and I'm below decks. Where be my harpoon, boys? Spring me, lads, spring. How? Oh, what's this? Wixon said incredulously, holding fast to the man's jacket tails. Confound it, but it's our missing man. May I introduce, Lizzie said, breaking out with a prideful laugh. Mr. Tobias Ellsworth of Anawan Street. Deputy Wixon, 
I believe this is the man who has been missing for three days now. Mon Dieu, je ne comprends, the Comte de Rien shouted, twirling his mustache. He stepped forward and peered into the wall cavity. The rest of the men stepped forward a pace to take a glance over his shoulder. Inside the wall was a tiny nest, about four feet by three feet, barely enough for a man to lie down in. Its back wall was exposed wood, through which could be heard the sounds of animals in the stable yard. On the floorboards lay a filthy pallet and a kerosene lamp, next to which rested a plate covered with insects, which had devoured what little morsels of potato and beans had been there to sustain the prisoner. "'You mean he's been in there?' Wixen said, staring at the filthy, crazy man in his grasp. King Darius let out with a howl that was both amused and offended. "'Indeed he has! That's the sporting hole I heard slip from the skenchback buster! Their way of spying on their fancy girls! I wouldn't have believed it, but there it is as evidence! And in my own ordinary, much to my chagrin!' "'Frank Rivers!' said Andre triumphantly. This is proof conclusive. Shall we arrest that rogue? No, Lizzie said. We need to hear from the thief himself. Let go my arm so I can scratch my beard, Ellsworth shrieked. I'm all a-crawling with critters. Wixen released his grip trusting that his charge wouldn't bolt for freedom as the man savagely attacked his own facial hair like it was bursting into flames. Oh, flukes and blubbers, I ain't been so infested since I last went a whaling. Damn that, Rivers. Promised to send my children to school with their betters. Promised me that Tobias would never have to go to sea or work the cloth again. But he wanted me to swap the egg, he did. Give him a tin forgery, he said, and let Borden take the blame. I say, let him rot in his own blubberworks. Damn that Rivers. Lizzie nodded in silent agreement. Wellington Rivers, the bank manager and paper merchant, is the mastermind behind this affair? she asked directly to the hairy face before her. Allsworth snarled. I, me ruffian, I'll savage his head, I will. He'll not suffer more in all his days. Andre raised his enlightened finger. I suspected as much. Rivers must be in the employ of the British. They wish to prevent the Bulgarian expansion. Perhaps they hope to raise the siege of Plevna. Wellington Rivers is their puppet. King Darius snapped his fingers. Aha! he exclaimed. And this Wellington Rivers was the investor behind this hotel. During construction, he must have personally customized room 209 for his nephew Frank's lurid frolics. Dare say that's it. Ellsworth focused his bloodshot eyes on the Pinkerton brothers who stood glaring at him. Galloping ghosts. Now he's split in two, he is. I waited all these days for him to go away. Now he's split in two. One of the Freds smirked. That split... Happened a long time ago, my friend. But this is all getting us nowhere. Where is the passery? The Comte de Comte shouted. Where are the plans for the self-acting mule? Lizzie smiled and pointed a finger at Ellsworth, whose face was now bloated with red welts. Dr. Bowen, she said, I believe if you examine Mr. Allsworth, you will find what you are looking for. She leaned over and whispered a word into Bowen's ear, after which a strange gloom passed over the good doctor's face. I will do what I can. 
I will do what I can do, he said resignedly, and then pulled Ellsworth across the floor and into the hole in the wall. The wallpapered door slammed shut, and for a few uncomfortable moments, the occupants of room 209 were treated to a symphony of howls and curses, giant whoops, and prayers to various North Atlantic whales and their Leviathan god. Then, after what seemed like an eternity, the doorway opened once more, and Allsworth appeared, more disheveled than before, holding up his beltless pants so that they wouldn't plummet to his heels. He stepped forward carefully, with jackknifing legs giving the appearance that he was walking over gravel. Flukes and blubber, he bellowed, fleeing back to Deputy Wixon, as if the policeman were some form of safe port in an otherwise hostile ocean. At that moment, the deputy took out some metallic wristlets to bind the whaleman's hands. Dr. Bowen appeared back in the room with his jacket removed and one sleeve rolled up past the elbow. In his hand, he held a shiny metallic egg about an inch in diameter. He held it aloft with delicacy. Careful, he said. It must be washed. De passerie, the Comte de Rien roared and raced forward to toss both his arms about the befuddled doctor who collapsed like a boneless fish between the Frenchman's mighty timber-like arms. Lizzie stepped before Allsworth, waked in his gum boots. Ay, lassie, you may think me a filthy and despicable codger, he groaned, but I had my reasons. Your family is starving, she said in a whispery sad voice. After my father evicted you, you had no choice but to take up River's offer. You have been twice betrayed. A sparkle came into the man's desperate eyes. Here's a girl who speaks righteous. You tell him. He tugged at his shackles. You describe how a man's beloved wife and children can be tossed into the street like so much awful. It's not a sane world, is it? Locked up in a disgusting hole for three days. I was told what would be done to my lads and lassies if I gave up the game, so I hid. For many days now I hid and saw the sun go up and down through that accursed broken board. My life has been darkness and horse dung, I tell ye, and not even a place to empty my slops. You can imagine what I'm going to say to Rivers the next time I sees him. Yes, I'll walk right up to his fancy house and knock on the door, and when his high and mighty butler comes to toss me by the seat of my pants, I'll let loose my slops all over his European carpets. You'll see how he stands up to that. Yes, Mr. Rivers, send me to do some bottoms-up surgery on a poor defenseless Cossack. We'll see who will now take care of old Tobias Allsworth's poor starving lads and lassies. Lizzie gave a slight nod and the barest trace of a smile. Justice shall be done she promised, and startled the old whaler by taking his hands in hers. Everyone present stared in shocked silence. 12. A Plot Revealed Lizzie Borden held court at the same table in the Wilbur's dining room as had been occupied the day before by Frank Rivers and his two skenchbacks. Barkeep Sam Samways, late of South Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, provided some hops and spirits for the men, while Lizzie drank a fresh cup of orange pico. The Comte and the Vicomte de Rien sat together, a large mountain and his smaller, thinner copy, flanked by the two Pinkerton brothers, Fred and Fred, who resembled each other in both countenance and attire, down to the last link on their watch fobs. Deputy Wixon was nursing a beer, 
having decided that being off duty was a much better position to be in than having to file all sorts of complicated reports, or explain to his superiors that he had solved a theft while making no arrests. Dr. Bowen was off rending to the physically ailing Allsworth, whom they promised to both morally reform and nurse back to prime health. For those present, the relief of recovering the plans for the self-acting mule had unleashed a wave of merriment that manifested much laughter and friendly banter. Lizzie, you must tell us what led you to discover the whaleman Allsworth in the wall, requested King Darius, his mustaches bristling. As soon as I saw the tin pessering in the midden heap, Lizzie proclaimed, everything was absurdly simple. The message within the tin was an insult hurled at a man in the back alley from a broken plank in the outer wall of Allsworth's hiding place. At that moment I knew that the plans had not only never left the hotel grounds, but no doubt were still in the room from whence they had been stolen. How that could be, when the entire room had been thoroughly searched, was still a mystery to me. But there was also this unnamed man, no doubt a stooge working for Wellington Rivers, who verbally and physically abused Andrew Jackson Borden on the street yesterday morning, believing my father to have been behind the betrayal. Yet his assault upon Mr. Borden provided the vital clue. Lizzie produced the folded paper from her purse and held it up for all to read. Hang ye be to Arcady. The whale ship Arcady, Fred Pinkerton the elderly said with a start, sailed out of New Bedford in August of 1875, went down with all hands except for one whaler who returned in disgrace to Fall River to work as a cloth doffer to feed seven children. Tobias Allsworth, Fred Pinkerton the younger concluded, vanished this Monday last and not seen in physical form again until he emerged from a hotel wall this very afternoon, turned into a gibbering lunatic by his long ordeal. The man who wild in the night, King Darius said bemusedly, the weird in the wall. Never again shall I ever suspect supernatural agencies when there is always a perfectly natural explanation. Indeed, I won't. It all does hang together, said Lizzie. Wellington Rivers, president of the Tiverton Rivers Paper Mill and co-chairman of the Fall River First National Bank, was suspected of sabotaging the whale ship Arcady to collect on insurance. It was his holding company that was found culpable in the sinking of the ship due to a faulty manufacturing of its hull planking, a finding that was buried under graft and corruption and never became public knowledge. The circumstances were known only to insiders like my father, who did not judge the man and even admired him for his thrift. Tobias Allsworth must have felt the need for vengeance against the man who destroyed his life. And Rivers, the Comte de Rienne said with a chuckle, was unsuccessfully attempting to buy up stock in a certain unnamed textile mill that I was to negotiate a technological contract with, one that would seal the fate of the Crimea. Being a paper pauper, Rivers was looked down upon by those men of cloth who run the looms and spindles of Fall River. He would have the perfect motive to steal the plans. He would have been able to open his own textile mill and triple his wealth with his exclusive use of a revolutionary new type of mule. Not to mention, Andre said triumphantly, he wanted to cast the shadow of suspicion on his nephew Frank, who had taken to the sporting boy life and so disgraced the family name. Deputy Wixon breathed a deep sigh. 
I am hearing all that you folks are saying, but I have a pretty predicament here. I can't just march into Rivers' paper mill and arrest him, don't you know? What crime has the man committed that we can prove? Ellsworth can only be charged with breaking and entering, and his ramblings about Rivers will be dismissed by folks who would sooner believe a man of wealth than a common cloth doffer. I'm afraid Willington Rivers is untouchable, Lizzie mused. His only punishment shall be his failure to procure the pessary. And what about Frank Rivers? King Darius said with an evil twitch in his eye. I can ban him and his likes and their libertine ways from under my roof, but they shall continue to roam the streets of Fall River, spreading their sensualist ways and provoking our finest women into lives of wanton decline. The Comte de Rien stood to his feet. The river's boy and his scurrilous gang shall be dealt with accordingly. Perhaps I can persuade some local men of substance to form a committee to abolish this social issue of sporting with boys and their fancy girls once and for all. Why, Lizzie, I shall even recommend that your father be appointed as a committee member since he has confessed to me in confidence his outrage at these acts of youthful folly. I thank you on behalf of Mr. Borden, Lizzie said. I'm sure he would be most eager to join your committee. More appropriately, the Comte said, getting to his feet and bowing politely in Lizzie's direction. I must thank you, Lizzie Andrew Borden, on behalf of the French government, as well as the Royal Tsar of Russia, for the recovery of our most valuable industrial asset, I will apply to my superiors for a special rate of compensation for you and your entire family, which will come from the sale of the self-acting mule technology. Merci, Lizzie said, winking at Andre, who smiled back at her. Fred Pinkerton, the younger, shrugged. If you fancy folks would only have told us simple folks about all these Russian intrigues, foreign wars, and golden eggs from the very beginning, perhaps the Pinkerton brothers would have been of more use. Perhaps we could have shared in the glorious wealth of this mule, whatever the blazes it be. Lizzie laughed. Have no fear, Fred and Fred. Payment for your services shall be paid liberally from my family's profits. And young Biddy Doran, the poor girl with the consumptive mother on Bishop Street, shall have a trust set up for her from the Lizzie Andrew Borden Fund for Destitute Children, as shall all seven sons and daughters of the lamentable Tobias Ellsworth. Nor shall I forget the orphan children of Jakorov, the poor Russian inventor, or his lovely new equestrian bride, who yet needs the funds to travel to America. I shall donate my entire share of the mule plans to that effect. Here, here, King Darius said, snapping his fingers in the direction of the corpulent Samways, motioning for a round of rice beer. Let us all congratulate Fall River's most excellent girl detective. When the drinks had been brought, all cheered and raised their tankards to Lizzie Borden. Hooray for Lizzie, they shouted as one. Lizzie sat smiling against the whitewash of the tall dining halls, her hands cupped around her warm mug of coffee, since she was of the temperance and did not drink spirits. The bellhop from the front desk appeared holding a letter stick, which he extended across the table to Lizzie. She jumped in fright at its appearance before her nose, snatching the note while the bellhop receded into the lobby. She read the hastily written words and then turned to her assembled friends. You must forgive me, but a Mr. Butterworth of the Saloon Furnishing Corporation of Keene, New Hampshire, is requiring my presence in the horse yard. I suspect he wants to engage me as a liaison between him and my father's business. Excuse me. Everyone continued to banter and drink as Lizzie stepped from the room and disappeared into the lobby. 
Andre, his instincts inclined toward her protection, eyed her through the dining hall windows as she turned the corner of the building, her hat bobbing, and disappeared behind the building. A moment later, King Darius twirled his mustaches, a sign that he was perplexed. Strange, he muttered. Mr. Butterworth was representing a furnishing concern in Boston. I think that he did leave early this morning. Butterworth, Andre said, lifting himself from the seat. Exactly, Fred Pinkerton, the elder, added. The man's face leapt into animated life. By Jupiter, he did leave this morning. I carried his baggage to the waiting coach. Zounds, Andre howled and reached behind his chair for his slender walking stick. Before anyone could comment, Andre had bounded away from the table and was sprinting toward the door of the dining hall, his cane swirling before him. 13. Kidnapped Upon entering the stable yard, Lizzie immediately sensed an unusual quiet. Only the sounds of traffic and pedestrians from the other side of the tall hotel broke the stillness, but within the yard itself there was a strange vacancy of sound. Her instincts told her to run, that a horse yard was no place for a furniture salesman to meet with a lady of quality. She had encountered fake notes before. Why had her instincts failed her on this occasion? Butterworth, she shouted, hoping that her voice would reach her friends through the dining hall window. I'll give you your worth of butter, came a familiar sneer. Out from behind a lumber shack came a swaggering figure, balanced under a stovepipe hat, walking carefully in stocky fireman boots. Don't be all in a twee, my dear. This ain't no dragon time. I have arranged for a safe transport to a place where you can fuzzle with a man of great import. Frank Rivers raised his arms above his stovepipe, and upon this cue, the yard's stillness was broken by the roar of a thumping horse. Before Lizzie could form any estimation of her predicament, a large barouche had entered the yard from the street, but unlike any barouche that she had seen before, it was an imposing four-wheeled high flyer pulled by a feverish white quarter horse, its nostrils blazing with wind. The bellowed hood formed a self-enclosed space over the carriage seats and draped black curtains hung down from exposed protruding dowels to conceal those who sat within. A pair of hands holding leather reins emerged from the curtains that draped over the outside box seat to drive the quarter horse that thundered before it. The barouche very quickly overtook Lizzie as she spun to make her escape. Frank Rivers had raced forward to grab her, and the flailing arms of sporting boys emerged from the hidden recesses of the concealed cabin to pull her up towards the gaping curtains. Mercy, Lizzie cried, her body flush with panic. Before she knew it, she was inside the shaky cabin, surrounded by Chaz and Buster, their faces convulsed in vulgar leers. The barouche was bouncing up and down with ridiculous exaggeration as she struggled. Surely, she reasoned, anyone witnessing this from outside would think it peculiar and raise an alarm. All she had to do was keep her limbs flailing. Frank Rivers popped through the curtains like he had been swinging on a vine, his hat missing from his head and his soap-lock grease dripping down his cheeks. Quiet, my lamb, he said. I am playing mere strumpet usher this afternoon. There's a man on the hill. Yea, he's got reason to ma wallop with you. Snaggle her to me, he said, and so we snaggle you. I am going to scream, Lizzie said. She could feel the barouche starting to move into the traffic of North Main. Knowing that her chances to salvage her situation were rapidly diminishing, she broke one arm free from Buster's grip 
and lashed out at Frank Rivers. Her fingernails, which had been grown to a fashionable length, tore across his cheek, slipping off his sweat and soap lock. Gah! he cried, raising a palm to his slashed flesh, which had started to ooze blood. You boggle dolly, you monster. You're the monster, she said defiantly, and feeling the barouche gallop into full speed down North Main Street, she spat in his face. For all that, he said, wiping at his nose, you will know a grand rib roasting. Lizzie closed her eyes, expecting the worst but was immediately surprised to feel the entire balance of the carriage lean backward, as if it were tumbling over. Sunlight splashed her face, and she opened her eyes to see the vast expanse of the afternoon sky, flanked by the moving tops of buildings. Someone, or something, was pulling back the collapsible half-hood above her, ripping it aside as if it were made of tissue paper, and the draped curtains to her left and right were falling to the street. All the grips holding her were loosened. She fell back as the barouche tipped, and for a moment she saw André de Camp stripped to his shirt sleeves, locked in a tangle with Frank Rivers against the clouds. Then all was a spiral towards the ground, and she felt the hard road beneath slamming her knees and elbows. Rolling over to prevent her face from hitting the dirt, she saw the broken pieces of the barouche and a sad image of the collapsed quarter horse lifting his whinnying head upwards. It took but a moment for her to realize that André de Camp had chased the vehicle of her abduction and had overrun it on foot. Somehow he had managed to get on board and rip apart, seemingly with his bare hands, the collapsible hood, at the same time knocking sporting boys off the vehicle. She caught a brief glimpse of Chaz and Buster racing down the street, limping and screaming until they crashed into a solid wall of Pinkerton Brothers. Apple bonkers, Chaz cried. Fancy some friendly fuzzle, Buster said in a panic. Let bygones be made, Chaz pleaded. No rib roasting for us, my skinchbacks. Within seconds, the Freds had chosen their targets, and the two sporting boys were airbound, hurled and twirled under. They fell like lifeless lumps to the ground, where they were assaulted by heavy workman boots. There was a gathering crowd on both sides of the street, full of respectable men and women in their fine dresses and suits, all of whom were cheering on the melee. Then Lizzie saw André and Frank standing arm's length apart from one another in front of the Phaeton's shattering carriage, their feet in angry boxing stances, their hands up and curling into fists. The startled crowd was now frozen in suspense as the two boys circled about an invisible center between them. A woman screamed. Another fainted. Dogs were barking. A gentleman cried out that someone should call the police. Far in the distance came the screeching of birds as they flew their indifferent path against the clouds. The entire scene was suspended in space, as if it were part of some famous painting, as if... Andre and Frank were two titans wrestling in some mythical moment that existed outside of time. You think you know this stock jobber? Frank Rivers snarled, and Lizzie realized to her horror that he was talking to her. Not in a sloven's year. Let him tell you the truth. Hang ye be to Arcady. Then he lashed forward violently, his arms swinging in graceful and powerful arcs. Andre stepped into the punches and reached for Frank's soap locks. At first, his grip slipped right off them, but in that instant, he managed to disorient the sporting boy. Lashing out again, he seized the locks like they were horns on a rampaging bull and pulled with all the full force of his physical being. Yikes, 
Frank Rivers cried, then sped forward, pulled by his own hair. Andre brought a knee up into the boy's abdomen, which brought another explanation, one that could not be represented by any word, and then Rivers was limp and defenseless. Andre spun him about and kicked him full in the seat of his trousers, sending him into a comical arch over the stunned quarter horse. Frank Rivers hit the ground with a graceless thud, his face landing in some equine feces that his own animal had treasured the street with, and then lay disturbingly still, the only sounds being a very thin and listless muttering of some random fuzzle talk. Lord, I be good to the bum wash all in a twee, my skench bag. And then he was silent. Lizzie forced herself to her feet, which turned out to be the easy part. Staying upright was a task she started feeling was beyond her capacity. Her pulled muscles dragged her downward as a frightful state of shock began to pass over her startled body. Andre stood before her, his face covered in dirt, his shirt torn, his body still braced for action, not exhausted or weakened, but strong and virile. Warm waves spread downward from her head into her limbs, a delayed reaction to the fear, the anxiety, the deathly grip that had taken hold of her body ever since her ordeal had begun. But she was held together by the sight of her brave soldier, her beautiful Vicomte, dripping in sweat, heaving with fear for her safety. Her feelings were very shameful, but in Andre's presence, she couldn't but surrender to them. She ran forward and into his arms, her face trembling, her tears staining her cheeks, her arms grabbing desperately at him, begging to be embraced. For a moment, there was a warm comfort, like she was falling through soft down in a summer's breeze with no physical pain, no fear, no danger. Her reverie was broken only by a startled yelp that dispelled the waking dream. Lizzie Andrew, she lifted her eyes from Andre's shoulder to see her sister Emma in the afternoon dress at the periphery of the startled crowd, her face aghast, her hands raised to her oval mouth. It's all correct, Emma, Lizzie said, not even loud enough for her sister to hear. Andre is my skench back. Then she fell into blackness, her last impression being Andre's arms catching her as she plummeted. 14. Justice and Lost Love The conclusion to the affair had little comfort for Lizzie's shattered heart. Despite the justice that had been executed and the financial reward reaped by the suffering innocents who had been involved directly and indirectly in the affair, there was still the smaller matter of the signet ring with the scarlet A embossed upon it. All else was neatly concluded. The pessary, with its enclosed textile technology, was returned to the Comte d'Orient. A few months later, a new textile mill, owned and operated by a Russian industrialist, became operational along the banks of the Quikishan, to much ballyhoo and a titanic flood of profits due to the introduction of a new self-acting mule that increased production and the pick of the yarn. All who held stock in the venture, including Lizzie Andrew Borden and her father Andrew Jackson Borden, had more money flow into their accounts than they previously could have dreamed. Lizzie, in turn, donated all her proceeds to a charitable fund for destitute children. The Doran woman in Bishop Street was able to find a proper home for her small child, Biddy, who Lizzie saw every Saturday afternoon thereafter for ice cream down street, and who eventually matured into a fine young woman, the first in her family to study at a university. In later years, Lizzie heard that Biddy Doran wrote serialized novels about social issues that gave Upton Sinclair a run for his money in the literary marketplace. Tobias Allsworth was set up in a proper apartment and, 
much to her father's concerted grumbles, given a job as a clerk at Borden and Almy's furniture concern, where he had responsibilities ranging from taking warehouse inventory to swaying customers' buying instincts toward certain preferred items. The more difficult concession that Andrew had to make was to allow Ullsworth to hang the copy of Poussin's The Shepherd of Arcady that had been salvaged from room 209, the most enduring symbol of his long ordeal, on the store's back wall over a field of rose-colored wallpaper. Frank Rivers and the sporting boys were arrested and brought up on charges of kidnapping and assault, plus the theft of a barouche from a carriage yard in Tiverton. Wellington Rivers attempted to persuade anyone who would listen that his nephew Frank had been under the spell of a charlatan mesmerist named McAllister Mundy, and so, Rivers contended, could not be held accountable for his deeds. However, Lizzie came round to Rivers' office one afternoon, spending no more than one half hour sequestered privately with the paper tycoon, after which all claims of his nephew's innocence were inexplicably dropped. Rivers produced one statement to the local newspaper in which he said, Frank is indeed a bastard stock from a degraded branch of the family. My sister found him on the steps of a local saloon, wrapped in fish paper. I cannot, with clear conscience, defend his kind. After serving a spell in prison, Frank Rivers, along with his Bedford street boys, effectively disappeared from New England altogether. It was rumored that years later, Chaz and Buster were hanged at the tombs, the large police dungeon in New York near Paradise Square, where they had been charged with crimes of innumerable unpalatabilities. It was believed that Frank Rivers became the notorious Bowery Boy Strangler who terrorized Mulberry Street in the late 1880s, writing taunting letters to the police with phrases like, I am only at my lick for leather, for the last was for Colt's tooth. The next one shall be a grand rib roasting. But that could have been mere coincidence. The strangler was ultimately caught and strangled to death by a vigilante mob. But the photographs then taken by the New York Herald of his corpse in an upright coffin are no longer extant. As for André de Camp, Lizzie saw him on Tuesday afternoon one week after the affair at the Wilbur. For several days her father had prevented the two from meeting, for he was seized with a sudden suspicion of the boy's intentions toward his daughter, and also embarrassed by the publicity that the public beating had drawn to the Bordens and the de Camps, disregarding the fact that André had quite possibly saved his daughter's life, Andrew bolted shut his home and stayed indoors during his normal business hours, just to make sure that Lizzie sat in her room all day, alone and despondent. He was hoping that some sense could be driven into the French boy who still, despite the father's precautions, insisted on calling at the Borden home every day at noon. By the seventh day, Lizzie had howled at her father to let him in, and Andrew reluctantly consented. Ten minutes, he said. I give you ten minutes with the boy, and then you are to forget you ever knew him. She found Andre in the sitting room, standing near the piano. He looked as dashing and well-kept as always, his facial scuffs a mere phantom of the past. His eyes brightened when he saw Lizzie cross the floor. He moved forward to embrace her, but she held her body back. She was giving the impression that there was an invisible line on the floor between them, which he was not allowed to cross. It is madness that we are kept apart so, he said, tears forming in his eyes. No, she said, her face cold and blank. It is best. Mais, mon Dieu, what can you mean? I know you have the best intentions, and I do believe, André de Camp, that you love me. I have never doubted it, and I have committed your poem, Lisbeth of Light, to precious memory. 
but I can never let you any closer than you are now. Perhaps not even this. We shall see each other in church. We shall see each other at the board meetings for the textile concern. But outside of indifferent and necessary encounters, we shall never talk again. Never. Do you understand? A dark shadow passed over his face. Pourquoi? he asked. Because you lied to me. You deceived me. In your attempt to save your father's reputation, you tampered with the truth. That was your ring that was found in the poor whaleman. The A on the signet stood for Andre, not Arcady. It was you upon which Wellington Rivers was attempting to cast suspicion. In your clever machinations, you conceived of this Arcady society, an anarchist cabal targeting Fall River to divert suspicion from your own guilt in the affair. He was horrified. His mouth trembled as he struggled to find the words. I was only trying to retrieve the pessary. I didn't think that my father's obsession with the Arcady Society was of any consequence. In France, he saw them lurking everywhere, and here in the wild land of America, he is even more fearful. I do not believe that this society even exists. Lizzie's face went dark as she contemplated something even more unthinkable. Or perhaps you are the Arcady Society. Perhaps you have attempted to bring this French breed of political unrest to our ordered community. Perhaps Rivers was trying to wipe out this pestilent breed of revolutionary activity before it could get a foothold in our town. She paused, trying to read the shifting shadows on his face. Perhaps I shall never know the truth. André de Camp holds many secrets, and the secret society that bears his initial is his best kept. I wish I could tell you the truth, he said, puffing up his chest. But I am bound by oaths. If you only knew, Lizzie Borden, if you only knew. It is best, she replied, that I never know. For the past seven days, I have tormented myself over this decision, and I must now reveal that I choose not to have anything to do with you. I care not if the Arcady Society is a mere figment of everyone's suspicions, and you are blameless. But after your painful lie, I can never trust you again. He lowered his eyes toward his feet. Somewhere in the distance, a fruit peddler was hawking his wares, and a bale barge blew its horn across the deep waters of the Taunton. I am sorry, he said solemnly, that you feel that way. I shall never forget your kindness, she said assuredly, and I shall never forget your poem, and I shall never forget the melancholy boy who once upon a time did indeed have love for me. Andre nodded, forcing back his anguish. He stared at her for a moment and then spoke very lyrically. "'Tis the hope and the beauty and the inner calm that we have won and must never slip." She moved slightly toward him, as if she were ready to embrace, but then stopped. "'Yes,' she said. "'Never let slip, and I never shall. I cannot live without you, he said languidly. His eyes widened as red came across her face. Oh, yes, you can, she replied angrily and left the room as quick as a whirling tornado. On her way to the staircase, she met with her father, who stood broad-shouldered, his chin jutting forward, a look of triumph on his countenance. What did I tell you, he said smugly. The boy is obviously a liar. Uh, say nothing more, father, she cautioned him. Do not talk to me for three weeks or I shall twist off your head. 15. André Lude It was not the last time that she would meet with André de Camp, the Comte de Grillon. 
Their paths were to cross again in several more of her cases, most notably the adventure of the phantom thespian and the strange affair of the hot and top Venus. And it was only a matter of time before she had cracked the code of the dreaded Arcady Society and discovered Andre's true role. In a strange, tender way, he was eventually redeemed. But she would never again open up her heart to him, as she had done the night that she first heard the words to Lisbeth of Light. Indeed, for all these long and sad years, Lisbeth Andrew Borden kept the words to the poem in a locket around her neck. It stayed with her throughout many an adventure, kept her company at night in the cruel days of her incarceration, provided inner strength when all around was darkness, and occasionally, when pressed by the rare Fall River resident who was old enough to remember the Comte de Rien and his daring son and the summer of 1877, she found herself transported back again to that time indelibly marked upon her inner soul by André's lyricism. As the sun descended over French Street and the sloping shadows amidst the elms reminded her of the faded evenings of yesterday, all she could do was to sigh and stare into empty space, perhaps inwardly numbering the years to see if it were even indeed possible that he could still be alive and upon the earth, and remark with confident melancholy, this coming summer I shall be sixty-seven, which means I do have a chance of perhaps talking to him again, of walking by the river and remembering to see that great wheel in the sky and wonder, for we are but passing shadows, and shall soon be gone. To see him once more, before no more. Yes, the poet really did find a hope and beauty that he wanted to share with me. I turned my back upon it, and perhaps that was the gravest mistake of my life. But I have never let it slip. I have held it right here, in this locket, for all these lonely years. Perhaps it would be nice to see him again. Very nice indeed. Yes. For I was very fond of him when I was a girl detective. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 26. And thank you, Peggy Ray Johnson, for your reading of The Melancholy Scion, one of Richard Behrens's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mysteries. Find Richard Behrens' Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube.